Okay, uh, Chairman O'Brien, whenever you're ready, I think people will still be joining, but in the essence of time, let's um, go ahead and have you kick things off. Okay, thanks, Angie. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Watershed Improvement Summit. I'm Terry O'Brien. I'm chairman of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy Board. And on behalf of the board, I would like to thank all of you for attending today's summit as we discuss critical issues concerning our region and how to respond to the impacts of wildfires and how to best protect our watersheds and our communities. Uh, I want to especially thank all of today's speakers and the Conservancy staff for putting together today's agenda. A couple of quick comments. Uh, today's summit takes place as the United Nations has released an alarming report on the threats of climate change. And as we read reports about the worst drought in the Southwest in the last 1200 years, all of us need to be mindful of the relationship between our forests and our water supply and how the well-being of the citizens of California depends on healthy forests. I hope at the end of today's summit, all of you will leave with a greater sense of urgency on the need to do even more to protect and restore our forests to a healthier state and how key components of that must be in finding value in the forest material that we treat and thin and the need for landscape scale projects. With that, thank you. And Angie. Thank you, Chairman O'Brien. Let me re reiterate um, our board chairs, welcome to all of you. Uh, we appreciate having you all here with us today for what is the Sierra Nevada Conservancy's eighth annual Watershed Improvement Program Summit. For those of you who are new uh, to this event or maybe unfamiliar with the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, we are a state conservancy under California Natural Resources Agency. And our primary initiative is the Watershed Improvement Program, which for those who know, is designed to improve the overall health and well-being of the region that we serve by addressing five integrated regional goals that together improve the economic, social, and environmental well-being of a region that is critical to the state of California. This annual event, the Watershed Improvement Program Summit, is designed to elevate and explore solutions to the most pressing and current needs and issues that, this, that our region is facing. So this year, we're talking about wildfire recovery. And Dave, can you flip to the next slide, please? Perfect, thank you. Um, the, the, the map, the, the slide that you're looking at is a map that I hope for you answers the question of why we're talking about wildfire recovery today. This, this image shows the wildfires that have taken place across the Sierra Nevada region by decades. Um, and I think um, if you look at that, that this last decade, I, it, from my view, it's terrifying. I think from the people who live and work in the region, it's a little bit terrifying. Over the past couple of years, we've seen more than 2 million acres burn in the Sierra Nevada. Two fires, including the Dixie Fire, which is the single, the largest single source fire in California's history, have burned up and over the crest of the Sierra Nevada. This hasn't happened before in the history of, in known history in California. In 2021, we saw 18 times more high severity fire than we might have expected based on his, the historical record. That's nearly 575,000 acres of high severity burn. 2,800 structures were damaged or destroyed across the Sierra Nevada over the last few years, including most of the towns of, of Greenville and Grizzly Flats. It's estimated that we've lost 20% of our region's large giant sequoias, which is remarkable because this is a species that has evolved with adaptations that have historically allowed them not only to survive wildfire, but to regenerate and colonize after wildfire. Crucial watersheds like the Feather River watershed, which you can see in the top far right of your screen here, um, have been damaged by the large fires that we saw there, especially over the last year. And our tribal partners and indigenous neighbors have seen sacred sites, biocultural values, and traditional food sources harmed or altogether lost. In short, we're living through a changing reality in terms of the impacts of that fire is having on the Sierra Nevada, but that's not the whole story. 
SNC and our partner organizations across the region have been in the trenches with, the, with these challenges for a while now. Part of our goal in bringing this topic to the forefront really is to elevate solutions and needs that folks on the ground have been advancing over the last few years. Since our creation, the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, um, our work across the, uh, the region that we serve has prioritized forest and watershed health. And we've invested more than $80 million to restore our forests to, to a more resilient condition and to reduce the risk of severe wildfire to our landscapes and our communities. At the same time, every year, as we watch fires burn across our landscapes, we are more and more um, pressured to begin to consider post-fire recovery and the ways that we can restore our burned landscapes to try and understand how to capitalize on areas that experience good fires uh, to increase resilience to future fires. We're asking ourselves questions like, how do we rebuild our communities? And what does it take to protect the values that we depend on the Sierra Nevada region to provide to the entire state? As a matter of course, where, the, where, climate, is, where climate is changing so quickly and impacting forested landscapes and rural communities so profoundly, when we think and talk about fire resilience, we of course have to continue to think and invest in proactive forest management. But in this rapidly changing world, as this map I think reflects really clearly, we're now also in a place where we must think and talk about fire recovery in a more meaningful and robust way. And when we have those conversations about fire recovery and what that looks like and how we implement it, we can't leave forested rural communities or landscapes behind. Not only because it's the right thing to do, but also because without post-fire recovery, we can't achieve our climate goals, we won't be able to achieve our conservation goals, and we definitely won't be able to meet our equity goals as a state. Thankfully, we're not starting from scratch, as you'll hear throughout, the throughout this afternoon. Historic investments at the state and federal levels are giving us the critical resources that we need to continue to invest in proactive, ecologically sound forest management. The U.S. Forest Service has established a 10-year strategy for confronting the wildfire crisis by dramatically increasing fuels and forest health treatments, increasing the use of low-intensity fire, and working collaboratively with tribes and partners to support post-fire recovery and reforestation. The U.S. Forest Service's Region 5 Ecology Program and the Pacific Southwest Research Station introduced a post-fire restoration strategy to guide how federally managed landscapes can be managed following large fires. And the state's Wildfire and Forest Resilience Task Force has released an action plan that not only calls for a strategic reforestation uh, strategy, um, but also calls for a coordinated, coordinated state, local, and federal strategy to prioritize and restore burned areas. Full recovery from wildfire is a long game, and it's going to require an ongoing coordinated strategy to restore resilience and meet community and landscape needs. So what might that look like across the Sierra Nevada? That's what we're here to talk about today. And what I think you're going to hear from our speakers and our panelists is that we really do need an integrated long-term approach that includes a variety of important elements, including landscape scale restoration, so that we're retaining the ecological benefits of fire in places that experience low intensity fire, and so that we're reducing the ris risk of returning burns. Strategic reforestation to ensure that forest regeneration occurs in, with native climate resilience, resilient seedlings, but, with with, but taking climate change into consideration as we figure out how and what that looks like on the landscape. Water protection to ensure the integrity of our, of our watersheds, which provide the majority of the state's water supply. We also need to include expansion of wood utilization infrastructure to facilitate removal of hazard, tree, hazard trees and restoration while creating economic opportunities for local communities. And finally, support for community-led initiatives because fire-impacted communities know their own needs better than anyone else and are well-situated to act quickly when given the right resources and opportunities. Unfortunately, there's no silver bullet. The scale and intensity of fires, of recent fires are unprecedented, unprecedented in recorded history. 
but we're not powerless in the face of these challenges. With action, we can help restore the resilience of our landscapes and protect the myriad values they offer while creating, while investing in community recovery and supporting restoration-based econ economies. So these are the reasons that I'm glad to have you all joining us here today. This is our shared challenge, but it's also our shared opportunity. I hope that today's discussion can inform this larger strategic path forward to restoring our forests and watersheds, to returning resilience to the landscape, and to rebuilding the communities that shape the character, not only of the Sierra Nevada region, but of the state. So with that, Dave, maybe next slide, please. This is the agenda that we've got laid out for you all today. Um, the first session, session one, will really set the stage for us and focus on what's at stake following several years of, of wildfire. We'll hear from a tribal representative who can speak to the impacts on local tribal communities who have experienced disruption in both their daily lives and in their cultural and sacred heritage. We'll seek to understand the ecological impacts experienced, experienced on our forested landscapes and the prognosis for recovery. We'll try and understand how responding to fire is central to the state and federal government's priorities. And we'll hear from Assembly Member Jim Wood, whose district has been impacted by significant wildfire events and who has been a leader on the legislative front in responding to the challenges proposed by wildfire in rural communities. After a short break, we'll jump into a strategy conversation with a diverse set of uh, panelists who are living and breathing these issues uh, in, in the places that they, that they live and work. We will not be using the chat function in today's uh, event, though you will be able to ask questions using the Q&A feature. We'll be posting the bio biographies of our initial set of panelists in the chat function as well to save a little bit of time and introductions. We'll be sharing with you the contact information of resources that you can contact if you're having technical issues at any point during this Zoom event. And uh, I think that's it for the uh, housekeeping efforts. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker today, Mr. Dirk Charlie. Mr. Charlie serves as the tribal liaison for the Dunlap Band of Mono Indians and is the point of contact for tribal councils for, sorry, point of contact for tribal cultural resources and land management. He's a former tribal council secretary who served for 37 years in the US Forest Service uh, in tribal relations, wildland firefighting, public affairs, and labor relations. Mr. Charlie is a US Navy veteran uh, Vietnam veteran and a former small business owner, among many other accomplishments that you can read about in the chat. Mr. Charlie, we're so thrilled to have you here today as our first speaker. So um, let me turn the floor over to you and um, thanks for being here with us. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'm gonna give you a burst of information from a uh, tribal liaison perspective, tribal council member, but also just a fellow citizen doing my best. So. Uh, if I could have the first slide up. The information that I'm gonna be sharing is uh, from a tribal liaison perspective and uh, all these mega fires that have occurred, I've been on the front line <laughs> on a lot of them. And uh, you mentioned uh, fires such as the Dixie, or the, the K&P fire, the, the, the uh, Cedar complex. Those are some of the things that, and the fires that I'll, I'll draw from uh, uh, past experiences. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation. I think they're uploading it right now. But for the sake of time, um, when I think about uh, these mega fires affecting our community, it affected me personally. You know, the, with the rough fire, I had to evacuate my mom. And that was something that was very traumatic for her, for me and my brother. Shelby, you know, he was a district fire management officer and it was happening in our own tribal homeland. So we had a lot of uh, concerns and issues that we had to be concerned on behalf of our people, but the main thing is stop the fire. So what you're seeing in that first slide is um, the uh, uh, a picture that was taken on 9-11 and I had to go take care of Ma, I had to evacuate her. She, there's no way she could have been there safely. So go to the next slide, please. I think uh, you skipped the slide. Um, but when I was talking about a tribal liaison perspective, 
I fit right in the middle with the incident management team. I work, my best friends are the liaisons, but I work for the incident commander and agency administrator. So uh, being that varied background that I got from, with public affairs and human resources, firefighting, I at equal employment, I've dealt with the local government folks. I'm in my um, uh, comfort zone working with fire operations, dealing with the media, working with disaster response operations, some of the the, the organizations listed in there. They're friends of mine. I'm very comfortable working with them. And I, I've seen uh, up front, you know, the impacts on each incident. They're all unique. and But it's something that I serve the tribal community in, and I do it with a uh, in the spirit of cooperation and leadership. Next slide, please. Um, when it comes to the tribal community, our cultural landscape has changed. Our cultures cross our, our ancestral homelands. They, 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 they overlap. And when it comes to our lifestyles, our traditions, economics, you know, talking about uh, work, talking about jobs, health and safety, you know, for our communities, access, getting the word out there. It's, it's something that for us, we're a lot more concerned about what happens now versus back in 2013 when the first fire on the Sierra, the Aspen fire came and impacted us. And from that point on, every year we've been impacted. So the safety and welfare of our tribal citizens and neighbors, uh, that is so important. The, the tight working relationships that we have to have, to have with, uh, with the Sheriff's Department for evacuations, well, we're getting better and better with the emergency management planning, um, which is something that I've been doing uh, with the tribes in this area. And it's something that we're getting better at, but it always needs improvement. Um, but when it comes to the loss of transfer of knowledge to areas of special tribal cultural significance, that's tied in with uh, the, the, the deaths uh, that's happened to in, in Indian country. You know, knowledgeable, reliable family, friends, and neighbors are gone, you know. And uh, when I think about uh, the elders, this is my dad, you know. Uh, back in the 60s, I wanted to be just like him. When Pop got out of the Marine Corps, my brothers and I, we were feeling like, you know, we're going to be just like him. So we went into military, but we also got involved in wildland fire uh, management. So my dad showed me where all the Indian trails were, where all the spring boxes were, our sacred sites. And he knew and he introduced me to a lot of tribal leaders. And, you know, and that made a difference for me, not just as a firefighting employee, forest service guy, but he also took me under his wing to introduce me to the tribal leadership throughout the state, throughout the nation. So it's with that wisdom and knowledge he invested in me, my my brothers, my sisters, and you know we did that throughout, you know, for the tribe. So uh, you know the, the tribal impacts; um, those are something we can easily communicate and and want to even better communicate in the future. Next slide. Those fires that we mentioned and that graph that you showed earlier, Angela. It showed the creek fire, and the creek fire is actually shaped in the shape of a dancing bear. I want everybody to know that. But I was on the, the Sequoia Complex in 2020 for 28 days and the creek fire for 23 days. So this is right in the land of the Sierra uh, uh, tribes. And I deal with all those tribal leaders and, and the tr organizations and the uh, spiritual leaders now, up to now. And uh, we've got things that we still that are still on our mind, and things that need follow up. But every year, it, it just brings a new challenge. Um, and I'm glad I got to be part of that Dixie Fire Tribal Liaison. I'm glad I went and helped them, and at least passed on ways and things that we've been doing over in this part of the country. But when I, I had enough on my mind thinking about the KNV complex, you know, that's a personal thing happening in my own backyard and everything. So that's a uh, areas that. Uh, yeah, try, but we we got we not only do we deal with what's happening in the future planning, but you know the current and then in the past we've got follow up and there's not enough of us to go around, but we'll do our best to be in the right place at the right time. Next slide. Fire recovery is very important to our people because after the fire, when it's safe, we want to go see, we want to assess what happened out there. You know, our sacred areas, our burial grounds, and everything. Uh, I, I need to go see these uh, these ridges, these these key watersheds, these riparian areas, you know. And I'm not just the only one. I, I gotta uh, we work together as a tribe. We're family, and they're asking me like, "Have you went out there, Dirk? Or did you go see what was happening?" Or you know, they're they're concerned about what's happening out there as the fire is going on. 
And I, as a line scout, which is you know, being a tribal, uh, being a hotshot foreman, I'm a line scout. I go out there. I go out there and I go see. And I want to go learn. And I, I, uh, I've i been uh, able to gain aerial recons on these fires and see it in it from above using my Hellshot Helitac experience. That matters a lot because you can see things better. Trails, roads. I can make a determination of an area that only Indian country knows. And I can come back and say, you know what? The fire burned through there. Vegetation burned. Well, that'll always go back. But there was no impacts to some of the uh, the sacred sites, pictographs, petroglyphs, burial grounds, and everything. That matters as a tribal liaison because what I say and what I share, that's in our hearts, burned in our memories. We know of it. It's not on a map. It's in our culture. And that's something that's very important. So um, when it comes to about what we're working with the tribes right now, a recovery effort, uh, right now, while there's an enhanced awareness of, of others trying to do the same thing, let's hopefully we can guide agencies, organizations, uh, individuals to, to help us, you know, to take advantage of these opportunities and, and, the, and the Native American favor. And uh, I hope that we can jointly prioritize the, the, the restoration work and the zones identified. We just recently went through a Creek Fire restoration uh, feedback session where, you know, I was very interested in those zones. And, you know, are we going to just take care of the urban interface areas, the affluent communities, or can we redirect some of the energy and resources to take care of areas that are important to us? You know, I, that's where the smart, inclusive planning comes in. You know, let's let's work together. Next slide. What does fire recovery look for us? You know, for my tribe and other tribes. You know, we're we're striving for the see through forest concept, and I'm engaged with uh, cultural burning now. This is a picture of a uh, honorable uh, tribal uh, chairman Ron Good with North Fork Mono, and I'm part of his team. I'm one of the foremen, and we're working with people. We're actually we're working on it. You know, we're doing things. And uh, we're, we're looking for accessible ways to gain access to our gathering and spiritual site visits, you know, by, by having those areas. Um, it's open to our tribe. We're sustaining our culture, our, our, the momentum. But we're also interested in the water. It's all about the water, you know, flowing from those springs, those creeks, the meadows, lakes, and rivers and everything. I'm a kind of a water spirit. I go on out and I scout it out. And, I, and I'm still able to hike these areas and, and uh, go out there and do it safely. But, you know, I'm not the only person going out there. I'm taking people with me so we can work together to take care of the land for everyone and everything. Everything meaning the, the, what grows out there, what animals live out there, you know. Um, those are the types of things that is in my heart and what I've been taught. Uh, you know, we don't just do it for ourselves. We do it for all. And when I think about the, the, the fire environment, you know, by doing cultural burning and doing this type of thing, It'll, it'll slow the fires down. It won't stop it. But I also know that the areas that I'm working at, I'm thinking about safety zones, you know, like where are we going to park? You know, where are we going to, you know, be able to set up that, you know? And, and I'm, I'm a, I, have a, I promote a, a heads up safety first attitude with everybody that I work with, but I'm also thinking about it. How would this happen? Uh, how could we utilize the good work in the areas that we're at? How can we use that to slow the fire down and also, uh, it won't impact the areas that are very important to us. Next slide. So when I think about uh, the people that come throughout the United States to come help us and everything, um, you know what, I, when I do my tribal liaison work up in the Dixie Fire, luckily I had friends up there to help me. In this slide, I've got Danny Manning, the assistant fire chief for Greenville Rancheria, and I've got Trina Cunningham here, the, one of the executive directors for the Maidu Summit Consortium, you know, they know their land. They know what is important to them. And operations folks, they're going to hear what I gather. And, and what if I can give them a platform to hear and share, well, then I will. And those are the types of things, though, that I, I ask locally. And uh, timing matters about what's happening out there during this time frame. What are you guys doing? You know, any significant areas? They'll tell me because they'll tell it to me in a way where it's culturally sensitive and, and, and confidential, but I'll, I'll be able to serve as a good interpreter for the incident uh, commander and the operations folks and agency administrators to know and understand the importance of why we need to include this in part of our planning. You know, but, but it's not just that. Um, 
it's not just the, the planning stop the fire, but it's also called suppression repair. And then, you know, how do we efficiently do it and effectively and cost effectively do it uh, in, in a smart, good way uh, to, to make sure that while we've got the resources, uh, before we release them, you know, maybe they can rework or work in this area. That's, that's what I've heard. That's what I understand. That's what I continue to market and promote. Uh, next slide. Contact, consult, and communicate. You know, when you look at this particular slide, this is on the Ferguson fire. And the number one question that tribal communities will ask me is, Dirk, where's the fire? Where's the fire perimeter? You know, they have a lot of anxiety and concerns. They got, they're responsible for the safety and welfare of their community. You know, so uh, tribal councils are. So, you know, we're thinking about our people, okay? Their domestic needs. Uh, there's lots of things on their minds. Yeah, but what can I do? My job, I serve them. I serve them in a timely and a safe manner. I'll do everything I can to, to help them out in their community. But I'm also friends with the sheriffs. I'm friends with the, the local uh, federal, state, local government agencies, the neighbors, the ranchers. Uh, there's a way to talk to mountain people. And I do it in, to the best of my ability as an effective tribal liaison. But, you know, do we have the right contact information? Are we consulting with the right persons? You know, they, are they authorized to speak? on behalf of the tribe, but the communications and collaborations is also oh important. And uh, I insert myself as a 24 seven, seven day kind of weak guy. Next slide. So what we can do now is try to build upon that multi-agency cooperative interaction, you know, and know your community. I, I always try to, I used to do a human resources and new employee orientation was the most important training that you could provide to an employee, you know, and they were, therefore introduce them to those partnerships that, that are already working, the ones that are working out on the land. But it's not just about meetings, my friends. You have to go work, go work on the land. And, you know, meetings can sometimes uh, consume a lot of time, a lot of corporate time, a lot of monies. But, you know, uh, there's a reason why I don't belong to some uh, committees and organizations, because it's like, I, I have to go work. If you have me right now, I can physically make a difference. But you know, when you do that, you promote an atmosphere of learning and uh, shared resources for the benefit of everybody before, during, and after a disaster. You know, so these restoration efforts, they're building upon things that impacted land. And, and I'm just from my own experience, from 2013 on, we never did go back and do what was recommended from the tribe but, and, and, and partner up with them. Well, I think that that was back in 2013. The, the Creek Fire just overlapped a lot of these fires that occurred in and around on the Sierra at that time. Same way with the Sequoia. Uh, go to the next slide, please. So when you bring local tribes and external partners together, you know, you create a better understanding uh, and you hear it from them. They're speaking from their hearts. They're, they're, they're pointing at maps. Uh, they're taking you out for site visits and everything. And those are the types of things, though, that when you think about what the tribes are already thinking about, they're, they're doing their preparedness and they're doing their response and uh, recovery action plans now. Well, we need to in, in, include them, you know, take, you know, big open arms and include them, wrap it around them and everything. When I go on fires, I make sure that they understand when the meetings are happening. And with that, the cooperators meetings are so important. You know, I make those face-to-face -face personal introductions to the decision maker, to the decision maker. And then they're able to hear the urgency, gain a sense of urgency from the tribal leadership that comes there. Or they'll say to me, Dirk, you know, I got a handful of, I've got lots of things on my mind. You know, top three things you want me to say for you on, on your behalf. And, you know, they'll quickly write that down. And they'll go on their way. But at least I got something to share with the cooperators. Meetings. Timeliness matters. Next slide. And what needs to happen for recovery? You know, let, let's continue to work together. And, you know, when I say tribes, I push them up front first because their priorities, they're dealing with domestic. They're dealing with their legislative. They're to me just dealing with their people and everything. Um, Indian Child Welfare Act, I'll bring that up for an example. I'm involved in that today in one of our, a case involving our own people. But it, see, it's not just about where you're living at, the natural resources and the cultural resources. 
it's about a people, but a people that are, we're trying to take care of our own. And we're also though, in the back of our mind, oh, we're not forgetting about what's happening out there with our sacred, our, our sacred sites, our cultural gathering areas, you know, our properties out there. It's very important. And usually you're gonna find these things out on the forest or a state response area up in the, in the mountains and everything. So again, we already have agreements. Well, let's look at these agreements again. Let's review and maybe enhance them and everything. Why redo the wheel? That's type of things that my dad would ask me is that, you know, we had already talked about that. You know, Dirk, how many times are we going to be interviewed or provide input into a plan? Well, what happened to the records? You know, we're referring to the agencies, you know, but like my dad said, Dirk, you need to stay engaged. Timing matters, my friend. Please be, be patient. But you need to do the reconnecting with tribal leadership in those communities. It needs to happen in a timely manner. Change happens. You know, people pass away. People get voted out. People resign. They decide to retire like me. Look at me. I'm having a great time, right? Anyway, tribal strategic planning efforts happening with Region 5 is, is a good opportunity to, to, to impact and to have a say and to uh, make sure that, you know, we're, we're included in these plans. Next slide. Oh, in that previous slide, it showed me doing my part, and burning some piles up there in Mariposa, because restoring these tribal traditional practices, especially with cultural burning, it can help restore the resilience with benefits for all. So my job is to train these students, uh, work with these tribal partners and, and friends and, and agency folks and everything about, this is how we're gonna bring the land back, you know, but I have to be a role model. I, I, I personally engage. So those are the types of things that, uh, this is just some pictures from last weekend, you know, a before and after picture. But we're always doing it with the safety first attitude, but we're also doing it to help train others and uh, hopefully they can carry it forward and tell the public all the good things we're doing. Next slide. So this is a shot of a Bobanich land, Mono Indian land. Uh, in 2015, in my first slide, it showed what was happening uh, with the rough fire and how it was, uh, it was something that surprised all, us all. But you know, the land will recover. So we went over the ridge from where that fire was boiling out of to uh, up further up north to the Kings River Canyon. Now we're in my sacred homelands. I took this picture, me and my daughter, we were doing site monitoring up on the, the Sierra on um, the Bear Wallow area, but look at the water, but look at the cleared areas. And we saw so much water coming out of it, but it needed to be, the fire did the land a big favor. It cleaned up the brush fields, cleared out all the snags, and it made things so much better. But, you know, the land will come back. We just need to have an opportunity to come and make a difference and work together. My friends, that's all I have at this time. Thanks for the opportunity to give you a burst of information. Thank you for that burst of information. And thank you for that perspective. I love it, we need to work together and the timing truly is important. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna open um, your little portion of this to questions now, but I would say that there are a couple of questions in the Q&A, Mr. Charlie, if you have an opportunity and can respond to those, that would be fantastic. Um, but thank you, thank you for your presence here with us today and for sharing your thoughts. You're welcome. Um, we're, gonna, <laughs> we're gonna move on to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Hughes Safford. Um, Dr. Safford is a research faculty member, member in environmental science and policy at UC Davis and is now the chief scientist for Vibrant Planet, which applies computer engineering and data man management to complex environmental problems like forest resilience and wildfire mitigation. Until quite recently, Dr. Safford was regional eco ecologist for the USDA Forest Services Region 5 for more than two decades, if I'm right. Um, but just recently retired at the end of 2021. In that position, this was, Dr. Safford was co-editor of the 2021 Coast Fire Restoration Framework for National Forests in California, which provides guidance for management and decision-making and burned ecosystems under the changing environmental baselines. This is not Hugh's first time at the Watershed Improvement Program, uh, Watershed Improvement Program Summit. So I'm delighted to welcome you back. Thank you so much for being with us. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Wildfire risk reduction and post-fire recovery in the Sierra Nevada. It is time to get serious. Let's go to the next slide, please. 
I'm going to uh, begin my talk with a quote from a colleague of mine, Dr. Paulo Fernandes, uh, who's a, a very well-known, internationally well-known fire ecologist from Portugal. Uh, he and I were co-authors of uh, the UN report on wildfire trends, uh, implications, and potential solutions that came out a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he and I and other folks have been giving a lot of media interviews in support of the of the report. And he gave her an interview to BBC on, on the 23rd. And I thought he had some great points that I wanted to start my, my presentation with. He said in this interview with BBC that we need to invest more in fire prevention in what he called full management, also in allowing fires to fulfill their ecological roles. And then he went on to say, but then when things get hot, the response will be to deviate from the policy that's supposed to be in place. In places like California, he said, they talk a lot, but then in terms of action, they always put the money in the same place in firefighting. Next slide, please. So we need to rebalance our expenditures and our focus in fire and forest management. I'm not saying should, we need to do it. Uh, in, in, in the Euron report that I was involved in last week, we suggested strongly that agencies, governments, and societies decrease the, the percent of money and effort spent on funding reactive fire suppression and rebalancing those savings among proactive risk reduction and post-fire ecological and socioeconomic recovery. In the, the diagram on the right, the blue bars represent uh, current U.S. investment across all sectors of society in what we call the five R's. These are review and analysis, risk reduction, readiness, response, and recovery. And in the report, we suggest, re suggest rebalancing approximately uh, as indicated by the green bars in that diagram, with a major change occurring in recovery where we see need of a major increase in investment. There's a, you'll hit, there'll be an in-between one here if you move forward. And then next slide, please. So here are the combined Forest Service and Department of Interior wildfire appropriations between 2011 and 20. Or rather, I should say these aren't the absolute values, but rather the proportional uh, dis, uh, distributions among four uh, classes. And what you'll see here is that uh, the amount of these bars taken up by fire suppression grows appreciably during this period of time, and the amount taken by uh, risk reduction, fuel reduction, and other, which includes some post-fire recovery programs, is dropping over time. Next slide. So this increasing emphasis on fire suppression, is it reducing burned area? Well, so what I did was I was able to get hold of CAL FIRE's suppression uh, expenditures between 1979 and 2020. And I would love to have included the federal ones here too, but somehow even to a formal federal employee, it's very difficult to get these numbers on a statewide basis. Um, anyway, but uh, what we did was we put together the three-year moving average of those fire suppression expenditures and then saw whether or not the acres burned in the subsequent year to those three years dropped or went up. And what you can see is that fire suppression expenditures are actually positively correlated with burning in subsequent years and not negatively. Next, uh, uh, hit, hit the forward, please. Uh, and so clearly, this is a very simplistic view of a very complex issue. And there are a lot of causal factors that are not, are, that, that not are, assessed, are not assessed here. But this general pattern suggests that our current policies are not producing the desired outcome. Next slide. So first of all, I think we need to ask the question, should reducing burned area even be our major focus? So this is a slide showing uh, burned area in California between 1980 and 2020. Sorry, this is in hectares. It was built for a European audience the other day. Um, you can see steady rise, some low years, some big years, but, uh, but there's a lot of fire in the last 10 or 15 years, at least relatively speaking. All of the uh, circles in red are years in which more than a million acres burned. And then I threw in 2021 there uh, with a star. It wasn't included in the regression. But what's important about this slide, uh, forward please, is this dotted line uh, at the top, which is what we would call the ecological reference. And what this is, is essentially the nor a normal burn year before 1850, according to our best information, would have been somewhere around 1.8 million hectares or four and a half million acres. Uh, hit the forward again, please. You'll note that in this graphic, and over the course of the last century, exactly one year has come anywhere near the pre-1850 average, and that happened to be 2020, which all of us thought as an Armageddon. Next slide, please. So my answer to that is that, yeah, in some parts of the state, ecologically speaking, it does make sense to try to reduce burned area, and I'll try to, try to qualify that with this graphic. But in a lot of, of California, it doesn't make a lot of sense. This is a graphic of the mean fire return, percent fire return interval departure. This measures uh, current fire frequency in the case of this graphic, this is calculated over the previous century, and compares it to what we know about pre-1850 reference fire regimes, fire frequencies in this case in California. 
And areas in this graphic that are in warm colors are actually experiencing too much fire today, ecologically speaking, i.e. they're burning much more often than we believe they burned before the arrival of, of Euro or Anglo-Americans. Whereas the areas in cool colors have too little fire today, and particularly the ones that are darker, these are places in which fire is actually very rare in the landscape over the last century, whereas it was very common before 1850. Uh, you know, this, this graphic doesn't include the last uh, seven years of fire, obviously, but given that this is a full fire frequency map calculated over centuries, it wouldn't make a whole lot of difference. But the point is, is that ecologically speaking, we need a lot less fire in places like Southern California and sagebrush dominated landscapes and a lot more fire in conifer dominated landscapes. In our conifer forest, less fire equals more fuel equals higher fire severity. Obviously, I'm not considering human communities and infrastructure here too, so that's an overlay to think about. Next slide. So I would submit to you that the real issue is not burned area in most of the state. Rather, it's fire damage to ecosystems and to human values, what we would call fire severity. Human deaths, structural losses, and economic costs are all rising quickly in California. One of the interesting parts of that pattern is that it's happening largely in Northern and Central California and not in Southern California. In fact, the total uh, average annual burned area in Southern California hasn't changed statistically in 40 years. Next slide. Forest ecosystems are beginning to experience hotter fires than they can withstand in the Sierra Nevada. Next slide. The annual area of forest burning at high severity now is generally much higher than it was pre-1850. And the extraordinary thing is that this is at the same time that the total area of burning is much lower now than it was before 1850. It gives you a feeling for how drastically fire regimes have changed. Please hit the forward button. So what I mean by high severity burning is what uh, 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 we call in fire stand replacing fire. In other words, locations where almost all of the mature trees have died on the map landscape. And so what this is, is it's a graphic of uh, an, um, an elevational gradient from the Central Valley to the Sierra Crest from west to east. Uh, but then on the left, everything's bulked into an all category. And what you can see is that our best estimate of pre-1850 average annual burned uh, at high severity in the Sierra Nevada was somewhere between 10 and 20,000 hectares. And in the last 10 years, that value has vacillated between 25 and 40,000 hectares. Next slide. Not only are we seeing a lot more of this very severe burning on the landscape, but the geometry of the burning has changed dramatically. We are seeing high severity burn patches that are absolutely gigantic. This is the Rim Fire from 2013. At the time, we thought of it as a catastrophe. Today, 250,000 acres seems almost right anymore. Next, uh, push the forward button, please. And then what I've done on this is I've uh, overlaid the footprint of the city of San Francisco. And you can see that there are burn patches in this fire where most of the mature trees are dead that are as big as the city of San Francisco or bigger. I mean, how long is it going to take for nature to rebuild a forest in the center of this patch? And the answer is probably centuries. Next slide. Thanks. Hotter fires are also causing deleterious, effect, deleterious effects to soils and streams. These are some examples from the Caldor fire in Lake Tahoe after that big storm in October. Next slide. And in low and middle elevation forests, there are, we're seeing negative impacts to a lot of different plant and animal species. So there'll be a number of sort of intermediate forwards here. If you don't mind, you can hit the forward button. So with respect to uh, Pacific Fisher, for example, we now know really clearly that they basically avoid areas burned by high severity fire and they are found after fire in areas that, that didn't burn or that burned at low severity. Next. Lichens really get licked by high severity fire. We did a study of them in the Sierra Nevada, a uh, postdoc of mine and I a few years ago, and it takes decades to recolonize these sites. California spotted owl file follows the same pattern as Fisher. Very low occurrence in areas of large high severity patches. Next, please. And even herbaceous plant diversity drops notably in high severity burn patches in the Sierra Nevada because in yellow pine index conifer forests, this kind of fire was not evolutionarily very common. Okay, next slide. Interactions among fire and a bunch of other stressors are provoking ecosystem transformations across the whole state. Just going to give you a couple of quick examples. Southern California, former Jeffrey Pine Forest. This photo is taken nine years post fire. There was no natural regeneration and the Forest Service failed three times. I didn't, they didn't fail. They just didn't. Their uh, reforestation efforts did not succeed in, in this site. Next slide or the next uh, button. Widespread loss of pinyon pine, uh, Jeffrey pine, and some other east side conifers in the western Great, ba Great Basin in California. This is an interaction between cheatgrass, fuel connectivity, 
uh, warming summers, uh, bark beetles and ignitions that are being uh, added to by human uh, ignitions. Okay, next slide. Repeated severe wildfires in the west slope of the Sierra Nevada are starting to reduce forests to shrubland in a lot of places, apparently irrevocably, particularly in places like the Feather River Canyon, where there have been three or four major burns across the same, land same landscapes in the last 20 years. Next slide. And even shrublands and those shrublands that are adapted to fire are having a heck of a time under current fire regimes in Southern California, for example, chaparral and coastal sage scrub is being turned into weedy grasslands because of all the anthropogenic ignitions on a lot of the landscape. Okay, next slide. So let's translate getting serious. Next. We need to relink fire management with ecosystem management. And we need to redefine our fire management focus in forest landscapes from reducing burned area to reducing fire damage. Next. We need to rebalance our expenditures in fire and forest management. Next. And uh, next one again, sorry. Of course, we have to maintain a robust and sufficient fire management apparatus. That goes without saying. But at the same time, we have to massively increase our investments and efforts in proactive risk reduction, and we have to massively increase our investments and efforts in post-fire restoration and recovery. Next. And I've highlighted this because obviously this is the focus of this particular uh, symposium. Okay, next slide. So if you go to the SNC website, you'll see some of their strategies for, uh, you know, fomenting uh, uh, faster wildfire recovery in, in California. I won't cover it since Angie just did this uh, before me a few minutes ago. Next slide. But what I want to talk about is how do we operationalize these priorities? First of all, we need to focus on large landscapes and collaborative work. Now, that's nothing new, and we've been doing this for a long time. And there are a lot of these projects in California, but a lot of these efforts fail or they underperform. We need more standardization. We need more accomplishment tracking. We need more monitoring. We also need to better link these kinds of collaboratives with strategic planning. So where they happen is where they need to happen. Next, public-private partnerships. The scales of investment required to solve this problem are orders of magnitude greater than the funds allocated by federal and state governments, even though all of us have to admit the amount of funding that's all of a sudden shown up in California and, and, and from the federal government is absolutely unprecedented and it's, it's amazing, but it is not going to be enough to solve the problem. Government agencies are slow, they're careful, they're deliberative, they have small operational staffs outside of fire suppression and limited capacity. And remember that we live in California and California is the great incubator of innovation on planet earth. A blending of public, private and academic sector ideas and actions is going to be necessary to achieve the proper speed and scale. Next, ecosystem services. Currently, our primary focus in fire management is protecting human assets. That's it. There really isn't anything else going on, um, except in some rare, rare places on the landscape. Carbon cap and trade funding in California is starting to change this pattern a little bit in terms of thinking about areas outside of the WUI, but we need to also link other ecosystem benefits to agency funding levels, uh, private investment and interest and prioritization, especially water, right? Next slide, please. We need to modernize reforestation. Reforestation is not the same as restoration, but it can be a key part of it if it's done right, but it can also be inimical to restoration if it's not done right. We have very little capacity and infrastructure and there's a need for new investment, new engagement, new ideas in science, and we need to move away from, from a production focus to emphasize ecosystem services and forest resilience. Next. Socioeconomics are obviously giant and I'm sure we'll hear a lot about this. Uh, in the uh, Q&A session, need to reconnect forest communities with the forest resource base. There are very few sawmills left in California that have room for any federal logs. Biomass energy has really taken a hit in the last 10 or 15 years and novel wood utilization has been a dream for decades, but all of it's gonna require more subsidy and investment. Next. And then finally, we need to spatially and temporally prioritize effort. We need to make investments where they matter. We need to treat the important acres, not just the easy acres or the politically expedient acres. So I'm going to finish my presentation with just a couple of notes about some new strategies and some new decisions to support tools. Next. So Angie talked a little bit about the post-fire restoration framework. This is a strategic science-based approach to post-fire ecosystem management. We focused on the national forest, but it's implementable in any sort of landscape that's similar to the landscapes the Forest Service manages. Next. It's a strategic, not, not tactical document, right? It promulgates a way of thinking about post-fire management. It doesn't endorse particular management tactics, although it does endorse an openness to new and innovative management techniques centered on terrestrial vegetation. Next. 
And it's based on six fundamental ecological principles, restoring key processes, considering broader scales of space and time than the fire perimeter, promoting biodiversity, sustaining key ecosystem services, incorporating adaptation to change, particularly climate change, and prioritizing management interventions. And then my last slide. So, and there are a bunch of new prioritization and decision support tools out there as well. And just to, to sensitize you to some of them, Forces is being used uh, around the country now. And in fact, it's the optimization routine used in the land tender tool mentioned lower down as well. It's a scenario planning tool that optimizes scheduling for forest management, and it's the basis for the current forest service fuel management strategy. The post-fire restoration prioritization tool is a tool developed uh, by some colleagues of mine and myself at a UC Davis and a few other colleague organizations. It's meant for chaparral ecosystems and it's being used, uh, for example, on the Angeles National Forest to drive uh, restoration priorities. And then finally, land tender and full disclosure, I am currently employed by the organization that developed and is uh, seeking to implement land tender in California, but it's a cloud-based decision support tool for management scenario building that in includes simulations, risk assessments, optimization, scheduling, and even cost estimates for projects. And we're developing a module in land tender that will actually operationalize the post-fire restoration framework. Thanks. Thank you, Hugh. Always count on you to come and tell it exactly like it is. So thank you for that. It's a lot um, easier now that I've left the agency. <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of questions that are popping up in the Q&A, um, though I hope you'll stay stick around and join us, uh, rejoin the, all of us for the Q&A session at the end of the event. Um, uh, but if you yeah. feel like typing answers in there, that would be great. Thank you again for being here, for presenting um, with us today, and we'll talk to you again here in a little bit. In the meantime, um, I would like to, I am actually just, Super pleased to introduce um, our next two our next two speakers, uh, California Natural Resources Agency Secretary Wade Crowfoot and U.S. Forest Service Region Five Regional Forester Jennifer Everline. Um, you two, I'm so thrilled to have you two here today. Um, together, you're charting the path forward for the state and the federal government to address forest health and wildfire re resilience, and 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 including post fire recovery. Your leadership has been truly essential to the well-being of the region, Sierra Nevada in, protect, in particular. So I welcome you both here today. Um, the floor is yours. And um, I think we'll start with Secretary Crowfoot and then go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. And big thanks to you and your team at Sierra Nevada Conservancy for everything that you're doing. It's remarkable. And to Terry O'Brien and those on the board. You know, to me, the, the conservancy and its sister conservancies are key delivery systems for all that we need to do. Jen and I were texting before this, and we were fascinated by a lot of the data that Hugh was providing uh, and really appreciative of convenings like this to continue to educate us. You know, I feel really proud of a lot that we're doing, a little bit that I'll touch on now. But ultimately, you know, I think we're all students to understanding how conditions are changing and what we need to do. If this was a normal talk I was giving on wildfire, I'd spend a little time on the problem statement about how catastrophic wildfire risk is getting worse. But I don't have to tell this audience that, you know, and have experienced uh, more than, than I ever have uh, on that topic. I will say though, while the conditions are getting more challenging, certainly epitomized by the Dixie and the Caldor fire, just how hot uh, and how intensely those burned cresting the Sierra Nevada, while the, while the conditions are clearly getting worse with intensified climate change, I would argue that our, our interventions are getting better to the point that Hugh made, while we continue to improve our response capacity at CAL FIRE and I would argue uh, Forest Service, we are investing uh, quantum leap, uh, leaps of, of funding more than we ever have in the proactive pre-fire actions around building wildfire resilience. And those actions are paying off. During the Caldor fire, we saw fuel breaks around uh, South Lake Tahoe, as well as Pollock Pines actually allow firefighters to defend those communities. We saw a prescribed fire uh, burn up around Capels Lake. The Capels burn actually help uh, shape or modify fire activity in the Caldor. So we know these interventions are important. We also know that we need to increase our investments in post-fire restoration which is of course a topic uh, discussed here today. While it's hard to really you know, designate something as pre-fire or post-fire because it's really continuous management, um, we have under Governor Newsom 
proposed this year an additional $100 million specifically in post-fire restoration. And if that funding goes through, I imagine a good portion of that will be spent uh, on the Sierra Nevada. Um, I think I'm here to say there's never been a moment like this, both in terms of the challenge, but the opportunity. We have political leaders at the federal and state level fully aligned that we need to do a lot more than we have done. We have resources like never before, both on the state and the federal level. I'll let Jen talk about the federal, but the state, if we get funding we propose this year, we will be spending three, almost two, two point seven, almost three billion dollars uh, of state money in the next five years building our wildfire resilience. And we have a roadmap. We have an action plan in this wildfire and forest resilience action plan and an accompanying task force to, to execute the action plan. That task force, of course, led by Patrick Wright uh, on the staff level is inclusive. It's co-chaired by Jen and I, but it includes certainly um, many of you and really everybody who wants to participate. We have a ton to learn from each other and to get done. Um, so proud of the work that's happening right now and ultimately the work that has to happen moving forward. Um, and look forward, Angie, to learning from you and your colleagues, really all, all the lessons learned here today. I thought Hugh had excellent points about defining destruction, not in the acres burned, but using other metrics, recognizing fire on the landscape is what uh, is part of our ecological process that continues to be needed. So in any event, I appreciate the convening and Jen, let me turn it over to you for thoughts. Thanks, Wade. And again, everybody, thank you for the invite here, Angie and the folks on the on the video today. It's really happy to be able to have a chance to talk with everybody and engage um, at least for a few moments. So um, again, just uh, exciting times. Uh, I, as Wade and all of you have said, we certainly understand or are learning even more about the challenges that we have here. Uh, but boy, talk about a commitment by the agency and this administration um, to get behind this and hopefully in front of it at some point. And, uh, it, and it's coming. Um, I'm, I'm going to be there with it, <laughs> with Wade and all of you, to really uh, develop our plan and our strategy of how we want to uh, attack this issue and this problem that we have in terms of wildland fire resilience. How do we get more fire on the landscape at the appropriate level? Just again, like Hugh and Wade had just said, how do you start talking about destruction level? How do you look at intensity levels, low, medium, and high that we have across the landscape as well? So I'm really glad that way that you said and others of you have said that it's post-fire restoration. It's not just about reforestation. That's a huge part of it. And um, again, Hugh, you had said we're successful in some places and others were not, and we need to really learn from um, your framework that you helped develop for us, as well as all of our experiences of what makes sense on the landscape in terms of reforestation. But restoration is also watershed improvements, fill stabilization, access for the public, community resilience, recreation and visitor experience. That's all part of that restoration that we need to do. It's not just the reforestation, although that's a big part of it. We certainly need to develop out our nurseries, our um, other types of resources that we need to have in order to do a good job on the restoration part of it. What I'm really excited about is the tools and the resources and the partnerships that we have as part of this. Like Wade had said, we're, and you, you said, we're at an unprecedented time right now in terms of funding stream, not only from the state as well as the federal um, part of it too. So we have 700 million in disaster funding that's coming to really put towards that post-fire recovery, um, the actions that we all need to come back from, from that post-fire restoration. And again, that's the reactive side of it, but we have funding that's coming through the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, that's gonna be able to give us some funding for the proactive side of it. It's one big system, as we've all said. We wanna reduce that impact on the damages that are happening with fire on the landscape and make sure that we're having and we're setting up that resilient landscape and communities um, to be able to have this system be effective as we're moving through fire, coming through restoration if we need to, and then coming back to having fire on the landscape. So partnerships are gonna be key. We certainly have some funding that is coming. We don't have the uh, entire funds from the bipartisan infrastructure bill coming through yet. Um, it is coming at some point, probably in April is the last that I've heard. It's working its way through the federal system. Can be frustrating at times, guys, but 
that's part of our job is to keep it moving through the system as well. Um, but for my um, part of it, boy, partnerships are the key. First service can't do this alone. State can't do this alone. None of us can. And I think as, as we said, we've had so many collaboratives, we have great partnerships, we have multiple um, people and organizations that are working together. How do we harness all of our skills, all of our resources collectively to build a strategy for the state of California that we can all put into, that we can all see our place and have that collective movement together, looking and strategizing across all of our resources and our authorities. So I'm very excited about this time um, right now. I'm really happy that we have this task force, that we have the conservancy, that we have all of these partners because this is what it's gonna take folks. We're gonna have to come together and find that way to schedule success across the landscape. So we got a serious bump in funding, at least from the federal and certainly the state side, we've got some more um, authorities, but particularly um, from the congressional, federal congressional side, we have an understanding and approval, um, at least through that bill, that we need some additional help. And that infrastructure um, funding is really showing that our Congress sees the need. So let's capitalize on it, show what we can do with it, and then frankly, set ourselves up for being a great investment for the future and continuing some of that funding flow. So again, I'm so glad we've got the framework for post-fire restoration. We're developing our wildfire resilience framework with all of you. Um, we got some resources that are able to tackle the wildfire recovery, and we work with all of you collectively to make sure that we're building our strategy for the resilience part, doing the proactive part of the landscape. So I'm really looking forward to it and having future interactions with everybody. And I will stop there and turn it back over to you, Angie, and you can carry us through to the next event. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate the time. And again, thanks to both of you for being here today. I said it before, but your leadership really is critical as we sort of figure out our path forward and sort of think about where all of the opp opportunities are for us to sort of address the issues and, and, and do it, and in Dirk Charlie's words, together. So appreciate your time here today. Um, just appreciate all that you're doing. So thanks again for being here today. I'm going to keep us moving um, because we have another esteemed um, presenter to uh, join us today, Assembly Member Jim Wood. Welcome, welcome. We're so super excited to have it for for you to be here with us today. Um, Assembly Member Wood represents California's second Assembly District, a por portion of which in Trinity County is now part of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy's newly expanded boundary. Um, like the Sierra Nevada region, Assembly District Two has had um, has faced severe wildfire. Uh, in both its communities and, and across its landscapes. And Assembly Member Wood has been a leader in the legislature in responding to these challenges um, and, and the challenges that these wildfires pose to rural communities. He's helped pass laws to advance, for, advance forest resilience in crucial watersheds uh, to ensure that rural communities have the capacity to address wildfire risk and to help residents whose homes have been damaged by wildfire. So Assembly Member Wood, thank you so much for being here today. Um, please take the floor. My pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be with you today um, and for all the work you're doing uh, and others are doing to restore our forests, uh, rebuild our communities and protect our resources. Um, I'm very happy that uh, uh, Trinity County is a part of the Conservancy now um, and um, it has been added to the now, I guess it's 27 million acre region that, that the Conservancy comprises. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a real uh, positive for, for Trinity County in my district. Also in my district, we're fortunate to have the North Coast Resource Partnership, um, although it represents a smaller region, uh, they have much the same goals and efforts. Uh, they're committed to innovation and they collaborate with Northern California tribes, counties, and a diverse um, a group of stakeholders. Uh, good news, and and you you've heard some of that also from uh, from uh, Jen, Jen and, and and Wade as well. Um, I think policy policymakers in general understand so much more about the interrelationship of environmental and wildlife protection, forest management, watersheds, and wildfire recovery because of the work that you do. Um, through advocacy and education, uh, your organizations uh, make a huge difference in how legislators uh, can help achieve your goals, and we're listening. Um, the not so good news, uh, since my election in uh, 2014, my district, which covers five counties, um, 
middle of Sonoma County, uh, north to the Oregon border. So that Mendocino, so that's Sonoma, Mendocino, uh, Humboldt, uh, Del Norte, and then also Trinity County. We, we also have 300 miles of coastline in our district. Um, we've experienced wildfires, flood. Obviously, we're still um, uh, in, in, the, in the drought. Um, we, we might add pestilence if you call, uh, if you add COVID into that. Um, and really, quite frankly, we, we can't take much more. Um, it's been, it's been really, really difficult. Uh, just in the last year alone, I've been in my district during and after wildfires and stood on the parched and dry lake bed of Lake Mendocino, uh, in April of last year, as, as we made, as the governor made the first proclamation for a regional proclamation for drought in the state. Um, I've experienced a devastation of some of the largest wildfires uh, in California's history, almost literally in my backyard. Uh, twice I've uh, had to be evacuated from my home um, and uh, and saw the flight and in, in the most recent one in uh, the fall of 2020, um, I could see the flames with, uh, within less than a mile of my house. So these are visceral experience and, and experiences, and they've driven my commitment to do what I can to prevent and be better prepared for these disasters. Um, I practiced dentistry for nearly 30 years. Um, it's in my nature to have a particular understanding of the importance of prevention um, and ongoing management um, and, and maintenance. And, and I know what results can be when that doesn't happen. They're not good and they can ultimately be very expensive. Um, better to put the effort in at the front end uh, than spend on us unnecessarily on the back end, especially when results of no prevention and planning can be so incredibly devastating. Um, so what can we do about all this? Um, for many decades, California's primary response to wild, wildland fire has been suppression. However, California is a fire dependent ecosystem, and it's now clear that quickly putting out all fires is not only destined to fail, but actually has a major uh, is a major factor in increasing um, damaging, uh, increasingly damaging uh, fire impacts. So let me share a little bit about some of the legislation I've, I've authored over the years, including some targeted pilot programs and budget requests that I've made. And then I, I'd like to take a few uh, questions if there's time. Uh, this year, I've introduced two bills uh, uh, that relate to the topic we're talking about today. AB 2451 is about better planning for droughts, uh, which can no longer be treated as a temporary or emergency event. This bill creates a dedicated drought section within the Division of Water Rights, responsible for improving drought planning, uh, drought response, and climate resiliency statewide, and specifically directing the agency to conduct drought planning for North Coast watersheds. Currently, the approach is to temporarily assign existing staff to these duties uh, for the duration of the emergency. There are many reasons why this is short-sighted. Um, we need planning in advance uh, to, of drought conditions and the ability to prove, uh, provide guidance to water users. Uh, we're simply too reactive um, and not proactive enough, in my opinion. Uh, the bill would direct the board to prepare drought contingency plans by 2023 for North Coast watersheds that are priority salmon and steelhead bearing streams and currently lack meaningful water management plans for a future that's already here. Um, another bill, AB 2479, builds on past legislation and actions by, by uh, Governor Newsom and the, his administration to provide accountability and ensure that we are taking smart action uh, with long-term benefit. Um, the bill requires the state to, one, uh, give priority to forest and watershed uh, restoration projects, two, to report on CAL FIRE's uh, plans to increase the use of prescribed fire, and three, to report on the forest and watershed restoration investment plan for the Oroville, Shasta, and Trinity Reservoirs, call, uh, previously called for uh, by a bill I authored several years ago. Uh, last year, I authored AB 9, uh, creating a new branch within the Office of the State Fire Marshal that will focus exclusively on community fire prevention, preparedness, and mitigation efforts and the mitigation efforts of CAL FIRE. It will move eight existing programs and uh, duties currently uh, spread throughout CAL FIRE to this new branch. Additionally, the bill requires that all program staff and leadership dedicated to these programs be the last activated to respond to wildfire suppression missions. Um, that's significant because right now, uh, it, 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 often the prevention efforts um, uh, go lacking uh, when, 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 a, when, when we get into fire season. And, and as we know, fire season seems to be a year-round event. There was just uh, a, couple of, a couple of nights, it may have been yesterday, um, we had a fire, a small fire in my county that, that they actually used bombers on, which is 
unprecedented in in uh, in the first first days of March. Uh, so. Um, the bill also codifies the regional uh, forest and fire capacity program, which received $50 million in the in the 2021 early budget action for flexible block grants for wildland and fuel reduction projects. In one of the final uh, budget actions of last year, I asked for and received $15 million for the uh, Redwoods Rising project, a collaboration of the National Park Service, uh, California State Parks, and the Save the Redwoods League. Redwoods Rising is a um, large-scale forest restoration project in Redwood National State and State Parks to restore redwood ecosystems and put more than 70,000 acres of previously logged areas of the parks back on track to become the ancient redwoods of the future. Uh, two years ago, I authored AB 38, establishing a, a defensible space and home hardening retrofit standards for buildings in very high hazard uh, severity zones, higher high fire hazard severity zones. Um, it also established the State uh, Fire Preparedness Council with the goal of improving the scale and effectiveness of the state's fire preparedness, including the creation of regional community fire preparedness councils. And we continue to seek funding for these activities. Um, three years ago, I introduced a bill that later became budget language to fund research and climate forecasting and the causes impacts uh, that climate change on has on atmospheric rivers, a phrase that uh, until a few years ago, nobody had ever even thought of or, or conceived of, but uh, uh, it's real and we need to understand uh, how, we, how we can best uh, be prepared for the impacts that come when we have these large uh, storm events. Um, we, we hope that the purpose of this is to better operate reservoirs in a manner that improves uh, flood protection and operate flood, and, uh, flood control and water storage facilities to capture water generated by, um, by atmospheric rivers. In 2018, uh, another bill authorized CAL FIRE to collaborate with private parties uh, to execute prescribed burns and uh, directed the Natural Resources Agency and Cal EPA to develop a plan for forest and watershed restoration in, uh, investments to improve watershed function and resilience in the area that supplies uh, Shasta, Oroville, and Trinity Reservoirs. Um, cannabis cultivation is a very is very big in my district, um, and, uh, and although we have many growers who are legitimate and follow the law, there are unfortunately others who grow illegally and dispose chemicals into our watersheds. We need adequate funding to ensure that these illegal grows and the environmental impacts that result are stopped and completely cleaned up. Over the years, I have, I've been able to get funding using state budget requests to support vegetation management uh, to mitigate uh, and, and make uh, wildfires and make uh, California uh, more resilient to wildfires. I've advocated for more GGRF uh, monies to go towards these activities uh, and uh, successfully arguing that preventing these wildfires is essential to meeting our long-term climate goals. And in closing, uh, California has the scientists, uh, community leaders, NGOs, land and water managers, and the cultural wisdom of our Native American tribes to do what has been done. It has to be done. Uh, and, and you have my commitment uh, to support these efforts and make uh, much needed progress sooner rather than later. I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to be with you today. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take a couple as long as I don't throw you off schedule and me off schedule either. <laughs> Thank you, Assemblymember Wood. I see at least one question in the Q&A for you. I'm going to go ahead and read it out loud. Okay. Um, it's from John Amadeo, who um, is a member of the Yosemite Stanislaus Solutions Collaborative in the Central Sierra. His question reads, thank you for your leadership. What do you see as the role of, of means to enable adequate, sustained funding necessary to actually increase pace and scale of forest health work? How do we move from fragmented grants across multiple agencies to a unified funding stream. Wow, it uh, almost sounds like single payer uh, healthcare for forestry projects here. Uh, but I hear what you're talking about um, and, and uh, it, it does make sense. And you're right, it is, it is, somewhat, it is somewhat fragmented. And um, I, that's part of, uh, part of what we're trying to do, uh, at least at one level with AB9. Um, is and and give people opportunities to go, have a single single place to go, um, but it is challenging and and um, uh, I don't have a complete answer for that. Um, we do have uh, too many uh, places and that are often silos. Quite frankly, uh, making it really difficult. Um, I'm a big proponent of um, you know I would love to see a one stop shop uh, where people can uh, come. Uh, 
pitch their project to all the um, pertinent uh, agencies at the same time, get the input they need from everybody at the same time, uh, and uh, be able to go forth and do that. We did that in the city of Healdsburg when I was uh, uh, was on the city council there, re- related to um, uh, uh, building projects and, and uh, giving everybody an opportunity to take a bite at the apple and that everybody agreed on on the plan and went forward. And it's a it's a big time saver. Uh, make sure that everybody's on the same page. And uh, it ensures that if you're um, if you're trying to get funding from multiple sources, you're not hung up. Um, you get m- money from one source and then wait and then find that that money might expire before you get the money for the rest of the money for the project. So it's a huge challenge in state government. And uh, we're always looking for ways to streamline. So if you have anything specific, um, please, uh, please reach out uh, to our office. Um, and the contact here in my office on these issues is Paul Ramey, who's um, well known in the building as a, uh, on these issues. So Excellent. Um, one other question that is a background question, um, and that is, um, how can the state support and work with cities and counties in the recovery effort? Do you have thoughts on that? Um, I guess it would be a matter of what it is that cities and counties want. I think uh, we tend to be uh, very, um, you know, at the state level, we're, we, we do everything we can to support. So I think it's, it depends on um, specifically what, you know, what the needs are, what the disaster was and, and how, how we go forward. But uh, I would say that, you know, between um, OES um, uh, and our efforts with the federal government, with FEMA, um, and our, our administration here at the state um, have, have, have really, um, really pulled out all the stops when it comes to uh, trying to be helpful um, in, the, in the face of some of these, some of the disasters. So um, it re- I'd say that has, I need more specificity to, to really answer that, but um, we, we, we do, we're cognizant of it. We do take every effort to be as responsive as we can. Excellent. Well, thank you again for your leadership in this in this realm. Um, you know, I know you understand the needs and issues and the opportunities, and we appreciate all that you do to support not only the SNC, but um, you know, our rural forested communities. It's important work and um we just we appreciate you. So thank you again for being here with us today. Um, we're gonna take a five-minute break now, or maybe a, like a third eight minute. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks for right, joining thanks. us. Bye bye. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a break now. We will come back at two twenty five, so about eight minutes. Just uh, we're gonna sort of resituate, bring our panel members on. Um, we'll jump into the panel portion of our event, and then we'll have some Q and A at the end of that. So um, join us again here in about eight minutes. Thank you. Alrighty, we'll get started again here in just a second. Um, I will take this opportunity to introduce Elliot Vanderkolk, one of SNC's very own, who will be facilitating the panel discussion. Elliot's been with the Conservancy just over five years now, and in his time here has been focused on um, uh, leading SNC's role as it relates to the, the funding that the state of California received from the federal government for disaster recovery on the Rim Fire. Um, Elliot, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and then introduce the panel members. And thanks everyone for coming back and and rejoining us. I hope you had a minute to stretch your legs. Elliot, the floor is yours. Sure thing. Thanks, Angie. As Angie mentioned, my name is Elliot Vanderkolk. I'm the regional forester here with the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. And panelists, feel free to join in as we uh, as we get going here. Um, as Angie mentioned, I, I was hired about five years ago to manage a, an, an, an integrated fire recovery project based in Tuolumne County. So this was a unique opportunity that um, the state received from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, really focusing on increasing community and wildfire uh, resilience in the rim fire footprint. Uh, and it's really been one of the efforts that has led us uh, and advanced our thinking as an agency about um, how to approach these, these, these catastrophes and how uh, to come up with the relevant recovery efforts. So as Angie mentioned and Hugh mentioned briefly, we've, we've come up with these five elements and dimensions of recovery um, we're going to drop another link in the chat to, to, to read more about that. But this panel will be a chance for us to dive a little deeper on those five elements of recovery. Um, so why don't I invite, I want to invite our panels to, to throw their videos on and I'll introduce them briefly and then they'll have a chance to, to introduce themselves a little bit more. So today we're joined by um, Dr. Christy Brigham, 
who is the Chief of Resources Management and Science at Sequoia Kings Canyon National Parks. Ms. Britta Dyer, Senior Director, California and Pacific Islands at American Forests. Mr. Andrew Schwartz, State Water Project Climate Action Advisor for the Department of Water Resources. And Dr. Jonathan Cusel, he's the Executive Director at the Sierra Institute for Community and the Environment. So this, the, the structure for today's panel discussion, we'll, we're gonna start out with a round of what we're calling flash talks, which are just brief, brief uh, chances for each speaker to, to give us their perspective on um, wildfire recovery. After that, we'll have a few questions for the panel to, to, uh, to answer and hopefully uh, have some dialogue with each other. And then we're gonna to try to save a really good chunk of time for Q&A as questions come in. So please, please do continue to type your questions into the Q&A box and, and we'll hopefully get to a lot of them. So without further ado, I wanna toss things over to Christy. Why don't you get us started? Great, thanks so much. And um, thanks for including me in this amazing panel with this great group of people. Um, Angie made the mistake of um, directing us to talk about who in our flash talks, who am I? What do I do and how does that relate to forest recovery, fire recovery, and for me specifically at the landscape scale, it's always a mistake to ask me, who am I? So um, to start with a weird sidebar, uh, this is who I am. That is a picture of me in first grade in my Mickey and Donald sweatshirt. Um, and this is what I look like now. Uh, I am a scientist. I am super nerdy. Um, I that is my preferred way to receive information is in peer reviewed journal articles. And I spend a lot of time um, measuring things and communicating science and scientific findings um, to other managers and the general public. That said, I am a manager. I've worked for the park service for uh, 17 and a half years. And I'm very focused on taking science informed management actions on the ground. A uh, full transparency, um, I had the opportunity to teach a field course um, in Tofino, Canada, and they characterize uh, the people that live there as either um, First Nations, loggers, or tea drinking sandal wearers. Um, and I was definitely in the tea drinking sandal wearing, wearing category, um, which means that I'm an ecologist who values forests for what they provide, um, but also for their intrinsic value. And I just want to point out that science does not tell us what to do. Science is a series of if-then statements. If you do this, then you can expect this outcome with this probability. And in those conditions and under climate change, what we do is a choice based in our values. Um, and my personal values are very much aligned with the agency that I work for, the National Park Service. And as I mentioned, um, forests in all their complexity. Uh, it, I can't, at this point um, in this kind of a forum, um, it bears mentioning that I'm also known as the person who gets interviewed because I cry when I talk about sequoias burning up. And my husband said, if you could just learn to cry right off the bat, you could spend a lot less time with reporters. Um, so I just mentioned that because I think emotions are a good way to connect with people. Next slide. Um, what do I do? I lead uh, a team of about 60 scientists and resource managers who give information to our superintendent and management team focused on uh, managing over 800,000 acres in the southern Sierra Nevada, um, over 90% of which is wilderness that contains um, about 38 giant sequoia groves, over 10,000 acres, and has been massively impacted by climate change driven hotter droughts but has also been managing wildfire and um, prescribed fire for ecological benefit from the 70s and if 1970s. And if you had asked me when I came in 2015, um, I would have said that we manage some of the best condition old growth um, in the Southern Sierra Nevada. Uh, that is still the case, but we've definitely taken it in the teeth um, through a series of major wildfires. And we are currently seeing impacts to our system in terms of fire severity, tree mortality, and novel forms of mortality for giant sequoias like high severity fire and Western cedar bark beetle that an analysis in 2013 did not expect to see until 2070 or 2080. Next slide. Um, just to transition into the importance of landscape scale prioritization and management, 
All of our major stressors right now operate on a landscape scale, invasive species, insect outbreaks, climate change, wildfire, and our major values, water storage, carbon storage, biodiversity, forest health, are all also landscape scale. So to appropriately manage, we need to operate in a landscape scale so that we can leverage our different management approaches so that we can be more effective in our treatments. And so we do the right treatments in the right place and we don't overreact to climate change. Should Do I care whether giant sequoias move off my land onto the forest service? I don't, as long as they're still present on the land. Next slide. Um, forest recovery post-fire, we've had three major wildfires since I arrived in 2015, the Rough Fire, uh, the Castle or SQF, and the KNP. Um, we are heavily invested in forest management and fire management, and we have benefited from that in, in fire behavior that we've seen um, in the Rough Fire, where we had previous prescribed fire treatments, we saw very beneficial fire behavior. Um, but we are seeing these novel outcomes all this uh, sequoia mortality, lack of sequoia regeneration, mixed conifer old growth mortality, lack of mixed conifer regeneration. And we are working within our own landscape and across the landscape to understand where did we get beneficial fire effects and where did we get negative fire effects and how do we move into the future with fire? As all our speakers have said, fire is not going away. We need to generate a fire resilient landscape. Next slide, last slide. Um, just some examples of our landscape scale collaborations. Uh, we participate in the Southern Sierra Leadership Forum, the Giant Sequoia Lands Coalition. Um, we have had this really great Grant Grove Peninsula project, um, which has been funded in part by the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. And we're working on a forest resilience prioritization project funded by CAL FIRE with the Forest Service. Um, and we also are using GTR 270, which Hugh mentioned, with the Forest Service to address post-fire restoration from the Windy, the French, and the KNP. And I look forward to speaking with you more as a panelist. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christy. And Britta, we have you next. Great, can you hear me okay? I can't. Perfect, okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for having me. My name is Britta Dyer. Let's see, do we have our, real quick, do we have the PowerPoint up? Before we dive in, there we go. Great, thank you so much. So Britta Dyer, I am the Senior Director of California and the Pacific Islands here at American Forest and really excited today to chat with you guys about strategies for wildfire recovery under the reforestation lens. And hopefully we can kind of shake that up a little bit of what we mean by that. Um, you know, our goal here in these little flash talks is to kind of get you thinking. So hopefully we can have some what I like to call critical conversations uh, with yourselves and my colleagues. So thanks for having us. Next slide, please. Before I dive in, I just, oops, is there another one before that? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, before I dive in, I just want to say who we are, what we do. Uh, American Forest is a national nonprofit organization based out of Washington, D.C., we work on public and private lands with public and private funds. We've been around for about 150 years, in which time we've been able to do a number of pretty historic things like helping to create the Forest Service or creating uh, Ronald Reagan CCCs, or most recently also being able to help get the Replant Act uh, passed. So go ahead, next slide, please. And everything that we do, we just have four principles that really drive everything. That's water, wildlife, people, and climate. Next slide, please. We do this through our two programs, Tree Equity, or our Urban Forestry Program, and Resilient Forest, which is our large landscape level programs. And that's really the lens I'm gonna be speaking with you guys today about. Next slide, please. I did wanna pause here for a moment because if we're having these conversations, it's probably because we wanna have impact, right? We wanna have impact on the landscape. And so this is something that truly drives us uh, and me personally, as well as I know a lot of my colleagues, 
you know, being able to start our conversations and maybe even our dialogue later, thinking about how we have to base everything in innovation, right? And technology and climate smart science. And then really we link that to our place-based partnerships. We have this snowball effect with those champions, those who understand and know the landscape so very intimately, right? To then have pilot programs designed, like Christy just talked about, those large landscape level pilot programs that then turn into movement building. So as we have this dialogue today, that's kind of where we're trying to go. We're trying to create social change. In fact, I should have warned you if I haven't already. Uh, I am a social scientist. My background is in uh, forest ecosystems and society through Oregon State University. So fair warning. Next slide, please. I mean, perfect timing. I just warned you. What is reforestation? You know, what is the purpose of life, right? No, um, listen, the way that we have talked about reforestation, the way that we need to be talking about it today, and the way that we need to be talking about it tomorrow, there are huge steps in between this, you guys, right? The way we've talked about it before, to put it, to put it lightly, I like to call it talking about our sexy seedlings, right? Well, let's plant sexy seedlings, right? Talking about it in that way versus really elevating the conversation to be able to use reforestation as a strategy for wildfire recovery. This is where we need to go. Right. And it's and really even as land managers, as decision makers, uh, folks in policy, how we talk about the R word really matters. Right. And I'm just here. What If I can just plant one seed with you today. Reforestation is forest health. Right. And the more that we compartmentalize it and think that we're going to do this versus this versus this reforestation is creating forest health conditions of tomorrow. And so I just want to again, I'm, I'm using the social science card here, but. I want to invite you to the reforestation revolution, guys, okay? Because it's already started and this is, we need to be talking about it differently, funding it differently, scaling it differently. Um, I'll leave it at that. So next slide. So when we talk about reforestation, tree planting is not the goal, right? Planting trees is not the goal. Creating forests that are healthy and resilient in order to withstand wildfire or other disturbances, that's the goal. So in order to do that, we know that we have to be planting trees cutting trees, starting fire and stopping fire. And that if we're not doing all of those things holistically and really at once, we're probably contributing to unintended, unintended consequences in one way or the other. Next slide, please. So, so many, a lot of folks just don't, don't even know how detailed the reforestation process is. Again, you know, from the public eye, so many times it's, hey, let's plant the sexy seedling, let's take that photo up. Just wanted to lay out real quickly here what this holistic approach looks like from start to finish. And this is very, very simplified, right? Initial site prep, we are talking about a huge financial cost, whether it's from the permitting or the actual on the ground work, work capacity, et cetera, the planting, the actual planting in the photo. Then you have this commitment to a short-term success, right? That's like when we're getting in with our garden afterwards and needing to be able to like go ahead and grub or weed around it in order to make sure that it can be successful. And then we have a social responsibility to have a long-term management and commitment to these seedlings that we've put in, right? Hey, guess what? We're talking about climate change. It actually takes so much carbon to grow one and to get it there and transport it. It's going to do its job. Let's commit to it in the long run. That maintenance and monitoring the piece that, or M&M that so many people, we just want to kind of brush over. It needs to be brought to the forefront. Next slide, please. And if that wasn't difficult enough, right? Okay, there's many move, moving parts in order to do a reforestation project or recovering after wildfire our climate is changing. And so how we do it needs to change. That doesn't mean don't do what we know works well, but it does mean that we have to know what we know and know what we don't know, right? And be able to ask questions. Climate science is being born and reborn every single day. And so I just dropped these two slides in there to think about some things. So I just dropped these two slides in to kind of get some thinking, our thinking caps on here. So two ways in which we go about um, reforestation using climate smart lens is strategic spacing. So this photo is on the King's fire. This is where we're actually thinking about the spacing in between the seedlings, knowing that fire will come onto the landscape again. How can we plant in a strategic way so that they can better defend themselves as they grow? Next slide, please. This is um, just a placeholder for some of our work on the campfire scar. Um, Assisted migration, again, climate smart lens, right? The oaks are already showing us that they'd like to move uphill. Let's assist in that. In the same way that Christy just said, does it matter if the trees are on park service or forest service land? It doesn't, right? What we want to be able to do is help support these systems. So reforestation doesn't always have to look like just growing a seedling in a nursery, right? We can also protect what's already out there. We can grow or we can even restore. Next slide, please. 
So my point is, is that when we're utilizing reforestation as a strategy for wildfire recovery, we want to be using our climate smart forestry models, all of us, all practitioners, right? So being able to really integrate science forestry and policy at every single level. Next. And in order to do that, we have to have the tools in place to do that. Our reforestation pipeline or all the moving parts that have to work in order to scale up reforestation across wildfire scars has a number of pinch points to put it lightly. Next slide, please. And that was a, a study that we helped uh, with the Nature Conservancy and was released last year. Um, there's so many moving parts, you guys, right? So being able to collect enough cone, process enough seed, be able to have the capacity at nurseries to grow, but also even having the expertise in the workforce to then move forward. There's a number of things. If we're actually going to scale this up in the way that wildfire is already naturally scaled up across the state, we need to be able to unlock those pinch points. This is, you know, whether it's workforce or economic values, there's a number of different things at hand here, and all of them have their own set of challenges. And a lot of these challenges you, you are seeing and hearing, I talked about the reforestation resolution right now, <clears throat> the reforestation revolution, and we're seeing and hearing it come up everywhere. Um, and to be able to have a coordinated approach and voice is really important. Next slide, please. The pipeline and a lot of these different points I've made today have come up um, in a number of conversations. I am facilitating and convening the reforestation strategy working group of the governor's wildfire and forest resilience action plan or task force. And uh, for, we, we don't know of another state that's doing this. We don't know of another state that's truly putting together a statewide comprehensive strategy, right? So that means with both state and federal lands alike. That's really easy to say. It's easy to say maybe, hey, all lands or collaboration or shared stewardship. But you're talking, again, social science, right? You're talking about different organizations and institutions who have operated in different ways, that have collect data in different ways, that have prioritized differently, that have different funding mechanisms, right? And being able to say, hey, but we all share this one landscape. So what are the challenges? And then thus, how can we scale those challenges, the solutions to those challenges? And so that is what we are doing as we speak in that working group. And I know that we'll be talking more about that at the next task force meeting on March 24th. So with that, I, I have that next slide, please. I hope that we can all have um, some critical conversations today. I know Christy spent a little bit more time on who she is and what she does. The perspective that I'm typically going to come from is uh, I've worked for the last 13 years in the Sierra Nevada, whether it be regional nonprofit, local government, state policy. Uh, my hometown is in, is in D.C. Uh, traditionally, but I live in North Fork, California on the Sierra National Forest. So, uh, And I live on the Creek Fire Scar. So thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Britta. A lot to, lot to come back to on that one, I think, um, in, in conversation. Now let's continue moving north. It turns out, coincidentally, we have you all in um, moving south to north in terms of where you both live and work. So, Andrew, do you want to take it away from here? Sure, thanks. Uh, I'm Andrew Schwartz. I am the State Water Project Climate Action Advisor within the California State the California Department of Water Resources. Um, and we, we've heard... Uh, <laughs> Of course, my lights are going to turn off on me right when I <laughs> so saving energy. Um, um, so we've heard quite a bit from from the other speakers of the 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 how and what of of restor forest restoration and recovery after wildfire. I want to talk a little bit about about the why um, from the water spy perspective, and and I'll start kind of talking from this kind of cartoonish graphic that's up on your screen now um, of some of the things that we've been looking at and that we're concerned about with respect to the fires in, in the watersheds. And this is kind of just a general overview. And then I'll move down kind of more specifically into Oroville and, and what we're doing and what we could use some help with. Um, so just starting at the top of the watershed and these, these snow covered mountains that you see at the top, um, we're, with these huge burn scars and, and large fires, you, you create just a ton of ash and soot. And you can imagine with the winds in during winter uh, that especially if we luckily this year we had some uh, a wet fall, but if we had a dry fall, that dust, dust and soot can get kicked up and, and carried onto our snowpack and actually change the reflectivity of that snow, uh, making it making it darker uh, and more, it can, it'll, it'll absorb the sunlight and melt off, warm up quicker and melt off sooner. 
exacerbating the effects that we're already seeing with climate change and with warming where our snowpack is 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 coming off earlier which uh creates a, an issue for us with with respect to to flood control it's, it's hard to think about flood control right now while we're in a drought but i assure you it will rain again at some point and it will probably rain way too hard way too much way too fast and we'll dealing we'll be dealing with flood control again and so um that's an issue both in drought and in flood uh, conditions of earlier snowpack release. We're also concerned about these large stand replacing fires, uh, changing the vegetation on the landscape. How will that actually end up changing the hydrology and how the water runs off uh, with respect to uh, changes in evapotranspiration? Will um, having less trees on the, the landscape result in more water running off because there's less trees drinking it or more exposed soil being uh, darker in color and warmer drying out faster uh, result in and in, in less runoff. Uh, we're also have lost a ton of the canopy and tree cover that's shading that snowpack and keeping it cold uh, later into the spring. Of course, that again contributes to that earlier snowmelt runoff and even potentially sublimation where the snow actually just vaporizes into the air and doesn't run off at all. Um, you see these power lines running across the, the, the watershed as well. We've, of course, um, have heard all about the power interruptions and, and problems with power lines uh, and wildfire. Uh, we require we, we, we need those power lines that that run through the watershed uh, to take the power out that we generate from from hydropower generation. Uh, these fires are occurring at the hottest part of the year when we need that power for for uh, to cool houses and run air conditioning. So, um, you know, making sure that we have dispensable space around those power lines and can can maintain our, our facility connections. We've seen um, some water quality impacts from from burned human settlements and 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 uh, heavy metals uh, coming into the reservoir. We've also seen higher nutrients. Um, contributing to algal blooms, uh, some additional sedimentation, although that has not traditionally been a, a, a large issue for us, but also large woody debris um, from, from these large fires and, and all of the dead trees in the watershed. And then you get a, a large uh, rainfall event and you get large woody debris flowing into the, the reservoir. It can damage equipment. It can be dam uh, dangerous for, for recreators on, on, our, on the reservoirs uh, and all sorts of, of other issues. Next slide, please. So moving on, uh, kind of looking specifically at the, the Feather River watershed, um, you can see that in the last three years, over half of the feather has, has burned. It's this, uh, this kidney shaped uh, watershed and with Lake Oroville down here at the bottom left corner where the star is. Um, this watershed provides water to some 25 million Californians, hundreds of thousands of acres of, of uh, agricultural lands throughout the state. And I think you can see of, of all the major water, rep, uh, water providing watersheds in the state, we've taken it really on the chin, probably worse than anybody else. A quarter of the watershed, two point uh, of the two point three million acres, so a quarter of that has burned at high severity, so over seventy five percent tree mortality. So just the scale and size of the the fires in the in the feather are so far beyond what we've ever seen in the past that it's really causing us to rethink uh, how we think about fire uh, and our involvement in the upper watershed as we move forward. Next slide. So. As we've been thinking about how we deal with these, these major new uh, stressors to our system, we went through kind of a, a, an impact assessment, trying to identify what additional action plans we need to put in place. We really, we looked at sediment and debris uh, coming into the reservoir. You can see in that first picture on the top, that is uh, our, our annual operation of, of uh, gathering up large woody debris from the surface of the reservoir and towing it um, out so that we can get, get rid of it. Um, so 
we we've been doing that. That's we see about 20 acres of floating woody debris enter Lake uh, Lake Oroville on on any given year, and so we're ready for that. We have a program to deal with that. We are scaling that up this year to to deal with what what we think might be be coming in. Uh, after the the recent fires, we're monitoring for sediment and water quality. We have scaled up those uh, operations. We're, we're we're partners with this uh, Central Valley Regional Board's uh, Feather River Watershed Water Quality Work Group, um, and so we have been doing uh, a ton of of additional monitoring below burn scars to look at nutrients, sediment, heavy metals. Uh, you know, both under normal conditions and then out there after high flow events and sharing that information throughout. We also looked at, you know, our, our impacts to the people um, that that work in our facilities. And, and that's really comes in uh, into play during a fire event. We've had, you know, when when there's a big fire event uh, in the area, that's where these people who, who live, uh, who work at our facilities and need to operate our 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 pumping plants and our, our dams and facilities, uh, that's where they live. And so they've got to manage uh, both the threats to their house and their families and their property with uh, doing critical, critical jobs. And so we're putting in place uh, more emergency response procedures to help with that and to deal with that and to also um, protect our gray infrastructure uh, that might be at risk from, from the fires themselves, actually, that, that, fo- that, that picture on the bottom is actually a weather station uh, in the uh, in the Feather River watershed that was completely leveled by the Dixie Fire. So, um, you know, that's another part of our infrastructure that we depend on to as our our eyes and ears in the watershed to know what's going on. We've since gone back and replaced that, rebuilt it, so that we have uh, and continue can can be able to continue to lead. To, to monitor conditions throughout this winter uh, and, and get that critical snow and rain information that we need to, to monitor our system. And the last piece is, is the water supply. So the, the, the other three pieces are, are impacts that we've, we've seen in the past and we've been able to scale up. But the third piece of this water supply, how is it gonna affect the runoff? How are all of those things that I talked about in the, in the first graphic with the, the change in snowpack, so change in landscape, change in runoff, how is that gonna affect infl- inflows to our reservoir and ultimately the, the water that we can supply to our customers? That, that is really a new concern that we haven't looked at in the past. And so uh, that is where we are really uh, focusing our attention and, and, and increasing our efforts and, and trying to build some new, new information and new partnerships to, to increase our information, our knowledge there, and, and how we can contribute to the community and the response uh, to these, these new conditions that we're dealing with. Next slide. Um, so kind of some some potential areas of collaboration that we'd like to highlight and, and hopefully uh, uh, continue to um, to push on and, and find partnerships through 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 this interaction and others that we've been having with with at the SNC and, and other folks in in the watershed. Um, we really think modeling of the of the wild, wildfire impacts on the hydrology and potentially working with the scientists in this community to better understand what those hydrology impacts are, and then be able to use our reservoir operations and water supply modeling tools to really convert that and and quantify what these impacts are to to water users throughout the system. Um, So we'd be we'd be really interested in those partnerships. We're already doing some work where we've we've um, paid for and and had some flights of the Airborne Snow Observatory over the Feather River watershed in the last few weeks to survey the snowpack, to get measurements of that, that the albedo of the snowpack, how deep it is. Uh, we did some, some flights in, in October and November to get uh, ground cover and some vegetation uh, information. And so we have a lot of information, but we we really need some partnerships to, to understand how, how those changes are going to impact the hydrology. And then also some, some work in assessing these forest management uh, strategies. So we've heard about it from many of the other speakers this morning about uh, the right strategy at the right place at the right scale 
Um, we want to, you know, help contribute to those discussions and figure out what the impacts for water supply are and, and what those strategies that can be really most impactful for water supply are. We think we can, we can be a, a helpful partner in, in those activities as well. So with that, I will turn it back over to Elliot and next speaker. Thank you, Andrew. And our last but certainly not least speaker. Jonathan, you want to take it away? Sure. Thank you very much. Chair O'Brien, Angela Avery, and Elliot, thank you very much for hosting all of this today. Absolutely essential. Uh, Andrew, great setup. Thank you as well with that one map in the Feather River watershed. Uh, I direct the Sierra Institute for Community and Environment. We've been doing this work that I'll talk just a little bit about for the last 25 years. And it has really come together in light of what has transpired over the last 14, 15, 20 years in light of fires and the challenges so many rural communities have faced. The Sierra Institute, this is a picture of Indian Valley. We're ground zero of the Dixie Fire. And we've been working on facilitating, not quite yet, we'll get there. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we've been facilitating groups uh, in this area, along with across uh, the state of California and working on policy issues. I'm a social scientist by training and uh, a reformed academic, I guess you might say. Um, and Hugh, I want to address a little bit your point that you made earlier about rebalancing expenditures and proactive risk reduction, some things that we have to do to get to that. And with respect to Jennifer Eberline and Wade Crowfoot's comments on subsidy and dollars coming forth, we really need to think hard and uniquely about how we use those subsidy because this is an exceptional time, not only in terms of what's happening on the landscape, but because of those resources and what we do this year, next year, the next few years are going to be truly significant uh, in terms of implica impl implications. Uh, next slide, please. I mentioned we're ground zero, but before I even mentioned that, uh, Assemblyman Wood mentioned fires by his home. This is looking out my back door, that center slide, Moonlight Fire, 2007, it was coming over the ridge. Go to the four o'clock slide, lower right-hand corner, that's the aftermath after extensive uh, salvage harvest. And then left the Walker Fire, 2020, and that was in Andrew's map as well we're getting way too experienced with seeing these fires and experiencing them. What's unique, and I wanna mention about the Moonlight Fire, is that it was small by comparison, 65,000 acres, but 60% of it was high severity fire. And what we also learned, in fact, because of Hughes, Hughes and other studies, is that almost 30% of that landscape is now shrub. It used to be two to 3%. Shrub layer. Next slide, please. This is looking up and down Moonlight Valley, but this is after the Dixie Fire hit. So as it starts to recover, this is the end result. These photos were taken very recently. Next slide, please. So left slide is across the valley, and that is another drainage flowing down. And you can see the recovery taking place from the Moonlight Fire. It's Fred's Creek. Well, after the Dixie Fire, that's Fred's Creek from not quite exactly the same vantage point. But what you see is an area absolutely hammered. And we're not going to see trees in that area in my lifetime and probably my children's lifetime. So this whole restoration issue looms extremely large. Next slide, please. And some people have said, OK, it's no big deal. Big trees can survive. We know that's not the case. They don't with these mega fires and these really high severity fires. Next slide, please. And just a couple of other slides here. It wasn't all bad. Dixie Fire has a lot of mosaic burn and mixed in, of course, amidst the high severity. And that upper left hand slide is a backfire lit off my road uh, in Indian Valley. Next slide, please. But here's what I really wanna talk about. So if we're going to go forward with restoration work, uh, we have to figure out ways 
of utilizing material. And Sierra Institute is a nonprofit. We bought an old mill site. And this is a 28 acre mill site. That's the left hand picture. And on the right hand, that's looking up Mount Huff. Interestingly, you see a lot of smoke there. That's from yet another fire that's starting to burn. Lower right slide is as we started to remediate, there are some high levels of arsenic or slightly above background levels of arsenic. So we had to remediate. We spent close to $3 million on remediating that slide site. Next slide, slide, please. If you take nothing else from this presentation, it's to know that we'll not succeed if we do not not only invest in landscape, but that we also invest in wood utilization and development of markets. We have got to figure out what to do and how to deal with those low value to no value wood products. Next, please. When we started that work on the Brownfields remediation, we said, okay, this is gonna be a wood utilization campus. We need to think about different kinds of things that can be produced. This was developed about five years ago as we talked about, okay, from those forest restoration activities, we need to think about what to do with the biomass and that's in the middle there. We got to chip it, dry it, and it can go into some different things. Um, and that's, it was a pretty simplified perspective at the time, even though on the right-hand side, you see products. If we were to build a three to five megawatt power plant from chips to electricity, we can produce some electricity. Uh, we can also make some firewood. This was just what we were thinking back then. Next slide, please. So we started the first business on the, those right hand slides are one of the first biomass and uh, boilers and that heats there's an inset on the right that's a county building. This burns chips, it makes heat and electricity for that building. There's our first building. So we both created the offtake, the business, the operation that will utilize the chips that are being brought in on that slide on the left. And because we don't have a big truck dump there, we have to get a truck with a walking floor. That's actually emptying the truck right now. Next slide, please. We graduated a bit. On the right-hand slide, we've got firewood production. That firewood is actually for those who need wood after the Dixie fire. There's a lot of people in this area that were without firewood for the winter. So we're helping supply that. I should say, JNC Enterprise making the firewood from burned logs, you see log decks in the back. And on the left-hand side, we're building a shed. Uh, that shed is made out of cross-laminated timber products. And there's, you see the right panels up on the very top. Those are cross-laminated wood panels or mass timber. Immediately to the left of them, there's another novel wood structure using a cross-laminated product, which you see in that bottom slide. So we've got to develop different products from the material that's coming out of the woods. Next slide, please. We didn't ever really think that we were gonna do this sawmill construction, but when Dixie Fire hit, we said there are so many logs, big logs, instead of chipping and turning what is a high value material into a low value to no value material, we said, let's, let's put together a sawmill. And with JNC Enterprise, we've been able to do that along with Sierra Nevada Conservancy support. This was critical and they're piecing together. There's parts from about five or six different states that are going into that mill construction. There's a round saw that'll make cants, lower right-hand corner, it's a band saw. And on the left slides and lower left slides, those are some of the first boards that are produced. And you can see the tight grains, there's 30 and 40 inch trees that are being used and, and will be sawn to help rebuild the town of Greenville. Greenville is just on the other side of the valley and I don't need to show you pictures of what happened there. On the upper left-hand slide, you see a couple of units. Those are some of the very first boards that were sawn. They're going into a home. Behind those units are the chip pile. The chip piles are the chips that go to the Quincy boiler. So these are just examples of some of the products that we're now developing on that wood utilization campus. Next slide, please. And this is what we're thinking now as I wrap up here. And you can see 
that there are the, the darker shade or the gray boxes. So we've graduated in our vision of what's possible and what's needed. So when we think of forest restoration activities, we've got a sawmill now. We're actually gonna be making lumber with our partners. Uh, we are now also considering a larger operation to take the volume of chips that we have to make hydrogen or some other liquid transportation fuel to get to carbon negative, carbon neutral fuels. We're also exploring the idea of a local microgrid and we're talking with another company about a borate fire treatment for lumber that's coming out of here for fire resistance. And immediately above the borate fire retardant gray box, there's mass timber product. So we are exploring ideas of whether we can develop a community scale facility that can make a mass timber product that can go into affordable housing. The goal is to take burned logs, run them through the sawmill, use that lumber to help rebuild the town of Greenville, Indian Falls and Canyon Dam, along with create business and employment for the area. So this is part of utilization of material that comes out of the forest. And we need to think of treating not only the black, as we say, the burned timber, but we also still need to treat the green. And if we can't derive value from that material, we're gonna have a heck of a time trying to restore the forest. So this is really about restoring forests. And this is also restoring hope in this area because of the implications of the sawmill and the opportunities that it represents. Next slide, please. And I mentioned this, the upper right-hand slide is the very first mass timber building built in the state of California. And the Sierra Institute did that for Plumas County and that boiler sits inside that building. So as I mentioned already, we're exploring and hopefully in the next year, we'll have a pathway to making green fuels from some of the material. Next slide. And that's it. I appreciate, again, the support of the Conservancy for doing a lot of the work that we're doing out there and the support of JNC Enterprises with their creativity in putting together a sawmill and their experience in the wood products industry. And with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Now I want to welcome back all of our all of our panels for some discussion now. And I wanted to start with, you know, Hugh painted a pretty bleak picture talking about the size and, and most importantly, the severity of the recent wildfires. So I, I'm curious for the panels to, to weigh in on, you know, how does that scale and that severity impact your thinking about recovery and your approach to fire recovery? Are we doing enough? Um, obviously, probably that's an open-ended question, but uh, maybe Christy, why don't you start first uh, and then we can take it from there. Yeah, that's a great question, Elliot. And, and I think um, when I look at our landscape, there's a couple answers. We are probably not doing enough and we're probably not doing enough fast enough. So this is most of our forests are frequent fire systems and they are um, evolved to regenerate very quickly after a fire. And you've probably met one or two bureaucracies. You might be a member of one. Um, quick is not our strong suit. So if you take six to eight years to do your NEPA analysis, and then it takes you another three years to get the funding, um, you've got a lot, your regen, your natural window that the trees would have utilized is gone. And that makes it much harder. So we're not doing enough. We're not doing enough quickly enough. And as Britta talked about, we don't have the pipeline in place. So um, I think uh, what Andrew mentioned, like really, and the GTR 270, we can't do it all. So really prioritizing and understanding where are the most important places from a biodiversity standpoint, carbon, water, community development, and then going after that and going fast and maybe pre-planning those. So um, that's how I feel. We're not going to be able to do it all. Those high, huge high severity patches, no way. We don't have the trees. We don't. It's it's going to go to shrubs. And what are the implications of that? So where are we going to act and how can we do it faster? I think you, you know, you got mentioned there a little bit. I'm curious, you know, the, that prioritization exercise. So I, a lot of your, yeah, Hugh, please do come back into this exercise. Thank you. Great to see you. Um, 
you know, a, a key point of that you were making, Britta, in your talk was about this, this innovation and, and hitting some of those, those pinch points. I guess I'm curious for your response on sort of Christy's idea here of prioritization. So how do we, knowing that we can't, you know, we have this huge backlog of reforestation already on the forest. How do we, what, what do you see in terms of innovation for that prioritization exercise? Yeah, great. Thank you, Elliot. You know, it, this is one of those questions when we all want the silver bullet solution, like, are we doing enough? You know, is it half full? Is it, yes, we're doing enough. No, we're not doom and gloom. Look, um, I think we need to do our best and that we need to hold our accountable that best is, is better than what we're doing at the moment. Uh, however, um, there are a lot of, a lot of tools that we can use. Um, a lot of tools. In fact, um, Hugh mentioned a number of them, decision support tools in the end of his presentation, but I also just, this, you know, innovation, technology, science. Yes. We also have the social and political will right now. You know, wave kicked it off, but we have a moment in time to be able to accelerate these conversations. And we need to do that through platforms like, like today. Um, uh, but also there's a point where we need, we can talk about it and we can frame it. But being able to get on the landscape in a meaningful way and scale up, let's replicate what is working and go from there. Being able to pick, you know, I know that we are looking at a number of landscape level projects that bring in your three to five key partners and everyone has a certain role and responsibility and being able to start. I think that where we start and where we end is going to look different right now. We have, um, you know, you went from having a backlog to then now needing to get some more environmental compliance done. There's policy tools that we can get innovative about to do better with that. Uh, but ideally, I think we want to be, you know, down the road, we want to we want to put ourselves today during the reforestation revolution in a position to be able to just queue up and continue to move forward, not in a reactionary uh, way, but more in, in a way that we're preventative thinking. Yeah, Jonathan, I'm curious to hear your response to some of that. I mean, I think it's um, this prioritization exercise and uh involves give and take in some areas, uh, you know, across a, a large landscape. And then, you know, you've been active for so long in the moonlight. And then, you know, so even if we have these best laid plans, <laughs> how do we continue, you know, grappling with the severity? I, I, it, how does it, it seems like it takes its toll. The, the short answer to the question is I completely agree with what Christy said, and that is it's not enough. It's not fast enough. And I think the conditions that we're facing now are really, uh, Hugh might say that, well, they're not that different from 15 years ago, but in terms of where we are socially, where we are economically, where we are today, uh, there's a recognition among collaboratives, for example, of the need to expedite, to move fast. We in the, uh, the South Lassen Watershed Group, there's about a million acre landscape that folks had been working for quite some time, we saw the departure from some sort of natural fire interval and everyone said, it's coming. How fast can we move to help protect? Well, Dixie Fire beat us to it on a lot of that landscape. And it underscores the need to move faster, which is why this investment opportunity that we're seeing, it needs to be bigger and it will challenge our capacity to do the work because a lot of groups have got to ramp up, the agencies have got to ramp up, and there's some real staff challenges to that. So not enough, not fast enough, but at the same time, we need to move faster and we need to move more comprehensively. And that's why I think the collaboratives are absolutely be key because of their understanding where they exist, where they've been working, uh, great understanding and can identify a lot of those areas where prioritization can be done. Yeah, thanks. So I'm hearing more, we gotta do more and do our best and move faster. I guess I'm curious, given the long time frame that it takes, you know, Brady, you walked us through a lot of those steps in the reforestation, just to give reforestation as an example and, and, and wildfire recovery in general is a very long process. I guess I'm just curious, what, what does success look like? You know, how do we know if we're being successful um, and over what time frame? So I don't know who wants to start with that one, but um, anyone can wait. Anyone can feel free to weigh in on that one. I have all sorts of comments about that. So, but I won't. I won't fill the airspace too much. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people think we're doing enough already. Um, other people don't know there's even a problem. So. 
you know, there can be a lot of definitions for it. But the way I've always thought, ecologically speaking, is you almost have no choice but to go back in history and to think about the way systems worked before they started getting mucked with. It doesn't mean that's where you need to go, but at least gives you an idea of what the trend is. And you can use it as a waypoint as you, as you move forward rather than an endpoint. And if you just take something like the fire regime and you look at fire frequencies on the landscape, you know, over millennia and millennia before the arrival of Euro-Americans, you know, you're looking at four and a half million acres burned in probably an average year. Right now we freak out when we burn a million. If you add all of our treatment to that, it's maybe, you know, a million, 300,000. I mean, really all the money that we've got right now and all the interests that we have and where the economics are right now, we'll be lucky to come anywhere near the state and federal combined million acre pledge. And it's about a quarter of the need. So that's my answer. You know, so that's that. And I'm speaking from an ecological standpoint. And that's why I and everyone on this on this panel and everyone probably in the audience also understands the need to prioritize. Oh my God, these are way beyond our ability to respond. And so prioritization is absolutely key. One of the things I wanted to, is it okay if I just, I, so I, I'm going to do it anyway, so I wouldn't ask you. Um, so John, uh, what you were just talking about, you know, that our inability to do things, or maybe not inability, but the necessity to do things much faster and there's investment issues and all this other thing. So I wanted to tie it to what Andrew was talking about, which were the watershed issues. and. I've always taken a lot of heart from uh, the stuff that was has been going on in the North Yuba, uh, you know, that whole North Yuba Forest Partnership. Um, I hope that it can scale to something that can happen at, at you know, uh, on larger landscapes. But what went on there is, you know, you had this really interesting interaction between, you know, it had all the classic collaborative members, tribal groups, agencies, you know, local citizens groups, um, cities, counties, et cetera. But um, and also it's a landscape without a sawmill anymore, doesn't have really a functioning bioenergy plan in it or anything like that. So, but the investment that they got actually came, uh, part of it come, came from the water and it was tied to, and this is that whole forest resilience bond thing, right? That I don't know, that's quite grown wings as quickly as I, as I hoped it was going to, and it might, but there, you know, they convinced Yuba, well, Yuba Water Agency was convinced, either it convinced itself or someone convinced them that the money they were likely to save in terms of, you know, avoided costs on a whole variety of levels was sufficient for them to spend millions in investing straight up front in work. And so did uh, CAAA, you know, big insurance company. They decided that that they were losing their butts in California and they could either bail or they could try to find a way of getting some money up front in the projects that were going to lower their, you know, their, their long term uh, exposure. Anyway, Andrew, I'm interested if you know, know about anything else happening like that, because it's the first example I know of a water agency actually directly providing funding that could be used right away in project use. So let me just finish the statement. M many people might not know on this call that, you know, the way that most of these projects work is collaboratives happen. It takes forever to get them together, but then they get together and then there's a problem to find money. Well, now there's money all of a sudden, but even though there's money, most of it's not available up, up front, right? Because most of it's coming from the feds or the state. So it's all by invoice. So you have to get everything rolling somehow first and then, you know, it starts like a really slow chugging train up a hill. The only way you can really start, you can jump in and just start doing it as if there's a lot of money from investors right off the bat. So that that's why I said that. Anyway, sorry, Andrew, that was a long question to you, but that, that was a question, believe it or not. <laughs> and no, thank, thanks for that. And I, and I think the Yuba is a, is a, is an extraordinary case. And, and it was the first, um, the first thing that we looked at when we started thinking about how do we get involved in the watershed? What is the model here? And Yuba was the, the first group we talked to um, and, and, and talked to them about how they did it. Where did, you know, how, how did it come? You know, how did they come to that decision and, and what were the tools and the partners that they had? And so I think we, we, we did a lot of that and, <clears throat> I mean, to a certain extent, some of the conditions are a little bit different in that watershed as they are, or the partnerships and the the players than than they are in 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 the feather. But I think there's a lot of similarities, and I think um, one of the the things that we came to is is we really need to have better information about about that, that cost benefit analysis that they got to that they said this is this is going to save us money. And so that's where we, we really want to get to, too, where we can really make that make that pitch to to water users and and this, you know, the, the state budget and, and, and um, you know, 
where we get our our funding from to say th- this is going to save us money over over the long haul. This is going to be a good investment, and and here are the specific places that we think or the types of of activities that we think would be the most beneficial and and get us the best bang for the buck. And so I think that's you know that's where we're at definitely. Well, I think to me the really cool part of it, just to finish the thought, is that there was an actual example of water playing a role in landscape management where money was involved rather than just talk. I mean, really water is the big issue. I mean, even though carbon is driving all this, come on, as far as the state goes and, 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 and politicians and people's needs, it's, it's largely coming down to, to being able to, to have sufficient water to support 40 million people as the climate dries out and support ecosystems. So there's got to be a way to bring in our crazy water rights system, that notwithstanding, a way to, to have that ecosystem service and others feedback into direct investment decisions on the ground with money. You know, you had to connect those circles that are connected in some places, but for some reason aren't connected in this country largely. Yeah. Jonathan, do you have something? To yeah, I, I wanted to go back to a point and then go back to the point that both uh, that's being that, that you and Andrew are drawing out here first. When we talk about prioritizing treatment, um, I think we also need to be sensitive to the type of treatment as well. So there are certain kinds of things that we can do with respect to thinning and so forth. We need to mention that fire has to be part the reintroduction of fire because of its ability and because of the acres that we can cover with that. And of course, I'm talking about good fire. I'm talking about cultural burning and those sorts of things. So I just wanted to make sure that we don't lose sight of that. That's absolutely critical. It's not just prioritizing areas, but kinds of treatment. With respect to the issue of water, I completely agree. And we've been talking about it for 20 years. I'd run around with a slide presentation that would show our watershed and show uh, the water flowing to the Met and uh, agricultural producers in the Central Valley saying, we're connected, we're connected. But the data to get to that powerful connection, or I should say maybe more clear scientific connection is challenging because, and I want to ask Andrew if he would speak to this challenge of of, uh, data clarity about a watershed that's as big as the Feather River watershed for that matter. And the challenges for folks to say, yes, we think that's important, uh, we want to invest in these sorts of activities. That's been one of the biggest stumbling blocks over time to make that link, make it definitively, and then generate the kind of investment that's needed to treat the landscape. Because I think many players said, we don't want to ha- have our pocket picked. But if that relationship is conclusive, it gets easier. Yeah, I, I mean, I think... That that idea, you know, we're talking about it. Ah. <laughs> um, we're talking about a two point three million uh, acre watershed, a, a five thousand or ten, even ten thousand acre treatment is not going to move the needle. Uh, you know, in a water supply in a, you know, we deliver a million acre feet of water uh, or 2 million acre feet of water a year, depending on the, the rainfall. Um, so, it, you know, those those treatment, um, those small treatments probably are not going to move the needle in a, you know, a data framework like like you're, you're mentioning, John, Jonathan. But I think. What what I would like to see is a real accounting of of what the the these fires in the last three years have really meant to the what what they will mean and what they are already meaning for us in terms of what is what impact is that having on our hydrology? Did you know the the really bad we had really bad runoff efficiency last year, meaning the snowpack that we thought we had in the watershed did not materialize as runoff in the spring the way we thought it would the way it traditionally had was the fire were the fires any part of that we don't really know we don't have really an attribution study that that could look at that and say well you know yeah that contributed to it we have also seen you know smaller scale restoration activities up in the watershed have an influence on 
downstream hydrology to the extent that we've seen it in the data collection and or folks that weren't looking for it, uh, the forecasters and such who, who work on historical relationships, you know, have, have noticed that, hey, you know, we're not getting the same timing of the, the runoff uh, out of this watershed as we used to, what's going on there and gone looking in the, at what's going on in the watershed, looking at whether there were restoration activities or, or, or beaver reintroductions and those kinds of things that, that may have led to the hydrologic changes. And so we know these things can have impacts at the small, smaller scale and at, and I think we intuitively know that at this huge scale, they must have significant impacts. And so I think trying to quantify those things and, and figure out to the extent that the, the impacts that we've already seen have had an impact. And maybe we want to prevent that from going much further and, and whatever scale that is that we can do that. Let's, let's try and contribute something to that. Right. Let's, let's move in that direction. So I, I, yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna be able to say you know this five thousand acre treatment uh, to met metropolitan it's it's worth this much water to you we should do it but I think we can we can get there through these kind of broader metrics and and broader investigations. Could I just follow up on that really quickly? So you're saying conceivably five thousand plus four thousand plus ten thousand plus five thousand plus four thousand. So these projects across the landscape collectively can make a difference, can. I'm not saying they have or will, but that there in, might actually even be suggestive that there are some outcomes along those lines. But then to flip this thing, so if somebody proposes a project and say, what's your outcome? Well, we can't really show you watershed wide, so it's really hard to justify, but I appreciate your call for okay, let's look at the fire impact. So it's almost like the obverse. Let's look at the negative impacts of this and let's let's see what sort of impacts that can be. But I'll just say that there's been, and as I think you're well aware, there's been a lot of watershed restoration projects and recognition of the water forest connection in the Feather River watershed, which underscores the importance of this and underscores the importance of making these sorts of investments. And I hear your cautionary note, well, the data are still inconclusive, but with more conclusiveness would be really significant and could generate this kind of investment. Is that a fair statement? I think that's fair. Yeah. yeah so I, I heard from, from Hugh, I just want to go to one last question. I want to make sure we have time for Q&A. And, you know, Hugh, I heard you saying, you know, funding is a barrier, but then it's also even just access to money to, to move projects is a barrier. Um, I heard sort of Andrew talking about information barriers and, and knowing that we'll never have all the information we always want. Um, but I'm just curious for the other folks to take this barrier question. Um, are those the primary barriers you're facing? And, and maybe Britta, why don't you start us off there and we can have, we can maybe go around um, just thinking about barriers and how do we overcome them? Cause that's, that's what we're here to do is try to you know solve some problems. Yeah. And I've been kind of listening into my colleagues also thinking about your, your original question there about, you know, what is success of like, or what are solutions? And it's so closely linked to, to what are barriers, right? And, and and to the point of we don't have all the numbers, we don't know everything at this moment, there's a lot of low hanging fruit, right? We say we want to move faster, we need to be able to remove policy restraints, be able to speed up our, our the impact that we can have on the ground, right? So as we refer to all that green tape that's out there, there's a lot of mechanisms that we can use working with our policymakers and decision makers even folks on the line today that's like, hey, for SB 901, let's include reforestation and let's not have it sunset. Next. I mean, there's a lot that we still can do. So I would just say in regards to some of the barriers, there are policy barriers, there are financial barriers, but if we don't have the workforce, if we don't have the workforce in place and the infrastructure, so right for so for nursery capacity when it comes to the reforestation pipeline or the infrastructure in place when it comes to Jonathan and his projects as well, if we can invest now, when we're looking at what, $100 million in that wildfire package, we can, we've got to be able to use that in the most meaningful way, not just for kind of these like, one shot turnaround projects, right? But being able to actually lay the framework that gives us the foundation we need to build on that for years to come. Great response. Any other any other takers before we go to q and I'm interested in Christy's take because she works in a fundamentally different landscape in a national park. And there's a whole set of tools and processes that aren't really available necessarily in the parks and they have to look at things in a different way. I'd just be interested in what she had to say. Agreed. 
The, the general framework is the same as what Britta said. It's, uh, and, and it, depending whether you're, is the impediment, the pace or the scale. And right now for us, the biggest barrier to both pace and scale is compliance, is the timelines and um, the way that we are currently implementing the Endangered Species Act, the National Historic Preservation Act, the Wilderness Act, and NEPA. And that's not to say that those aren't amazing bedrock legislation that is the foundation of what we do, but they are built around the assumption that what you're trying to do is bad for the environment, and they are not um, set up to uh, expedite or provide pathways to do to re to do risk reduction, and they don't acknowledge the um, huge negatives. You have a no. I mean, you know all this. The no action alternative. I mean, it's just it's too. It takes too much money, too much time, and and by the time you get it done, your landscape's already burned up. I mean, I have the same experience that Jonathan did, where we had planned grove treatments for five groves in wilderness. And they burned up before before we could even put pen to paper for the compliance, let alone the funding. But workforce is also a problem. Um, and if you can get the compliance done, then funding becomes a problem. So yeah, it's the same. I just, I, just want I think that echoes a, a priority that um, Secretary has, which is you know the cutting green tape initiative. So I want to highlight that as a as a key. Element. But Britta, sorry to interrupt. You. No, but just thank you for that. I mean, Hugh, you just outlined, you know, that Christy's perspective would be different and the hat she's wearing. And I'm looking across the, the panel here. And I just want to just want to say elephant in the room wise, right? That like private industry is in here. And and I don't think I, and that's okay. I mean, I'm having a lot of really great conversations with them. I'm not saying they're not here. I'm saying we need to get in the habit of inviting them to these sort of things in order to have these discussions because they are part of the the barriers and the solutions, right? We're all part of it. And when we talk about all lands or any of these things are that, and when we talk about workforce, when we talk about capacity, and they're able to operate with that different hat, right? But some some restraints that you know, might exist for Christy versus for Jonathan, et cetera. So uh, let's just continue to try to advocate and bring them to the table. I technically represent private industry now, <laughs> but it's a different right. kind of you. Um, so anyway, I'm just the token little angel on the shoulder, I guess, or whatever. <laughs> Jonathan, do you want one last? Do you want a, a quick a quick answer to this barriers question, or uh, otherwise I'd like to go to Q and A. So you get you uh, I, yeah two quick two quick responses. One as I as I called out in my presentation, the barriers are that we don't have a lot of places to take material. Um, that's really clear, and it is something that can be remedied through investment. Uh, two, the workforce issue. Uh, this goes to private industry. We haven't paid very well for a lot of these jobs, quite honestly. So we've also societally denigrated the entire industry. So as we talk about this new restoration, recovery, revitalization of rural communities, we need to think of those terms when we talk about labor and rebuilding the labor pool, creating a diversity of opportunities, not single track jobs that take you not very far. So we need to think really differently about labor. And I am i will say we've already seen some signs that there's interest. Uh, so we combine those things and I think that will begin to address it. But again, we're behind the eight ball on it right now. So there's much work to be done. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna transition now to Q and A. Um, Emily or Brittany from our staff has been monitoring the Q and A box. I think there's some good, some good questions. So I, I invite one of you to come on and share with us what you got. Sure, Elliot, thank you. Uh, we'll start with a question from Chris Payne. Um, and maybe Christy is the right person, but I'll, I'll leave it open um, to the full group. How do we balance preservation of what is left not burnt with recovery um, and, and that 18 month longevity of burnt logs? Can we focus on both and are the resources available? Yeah, I'll just say, go quick with a response to that from my perspective. That is such a good question. And it is hugely important to focus on preservation of the green trees, especially the old growth. Um, I'm like, for my mental prioritization, it's protection of old growth, restoration of second growth, and then reforestation of high severity. 
Um, but for me as a manager, luckily those, those have different funding sources. So it's the same person. So I'm trying to do all three at once, but it's at least there's different pots of money. And it is a really good question because um, once the old growth is gone, whether it's a 150 year old sugar pine or a 2000 year old sequoia, that's a lot of lag time to get it back. And so I'm really trying to do um, look at the whole landscape and do the thinning and removal um, to protect the existing old growth or the prescribed fire along while simultaneously doing your reforestation. Um, it is really tough because it is the same people typically in the federal government, um, but at least we have different funding lines to fund those different activities. Anyone else interested in this one? You know, what comes to mind is Britta's talk about, you know, uh, recovery and reforestation really is forced health. And so we're, you know, we tend to draw the, this, you know, fine line between black and green, but at some, you know, I think, you know, Hugh mentioned GTR 270, these other things are encouraging us to look really at the landscape level, right? And so I'm just curious, and maybe we can't do it all, but again, that's comes with that prioritization, right? So I'm just, just curious if anyone has anyone, anything else they want to share on, on this one. I really to say that we have to manage black and green forests at the same time. We seem to pendulum from one to the next, you know, and basically it seems to have been driven mostly by the wood market <laughs> in the forest service, right? Allegedly we were cutting green forests and then we got stopped in court on all of it. And so everyone pinned, you know, swung over to treating burn forest. And then we got stopped in court on a lot of that stuff as well. And now we're getting back to where I think people realize we do have to remove a lot of material from the forest. So the recent paper by, by uh, Malcolm North and, and colleagues on operationalizing resilience, I think woke a lot of people up. I mean, a lot of us have understood that for a long time, but it's like, wow, we're going to have to remove a lot more material out of force than I think anyone understands. Otherwise we're going to lose them. And that's, isn't that sad? I mean, that's kind of the crazy irony, but in order to, you have to remember, we don't live in the Amazon basin. We live in California. Fire will happen. It's not an aberration. It's normal. And the question is not uh, if, but when, and what happens when it does. So it's going to take removal of some carbon to keep the rest of the carbon on the landscape. And it's the same thing with, you know, when you think about um, a lot of the stuff in the state, the whole fire issue, the smoke issue, it's going to take generation of some smoke to solve the problem, but generation of a whole lot more smoke if we don't solve the problem. So, you know, a little bit of loss on both sides, but I think avoided costs is a big part of all this. Being able to calculate the avoided costs of, you know, and that's where we are, we're not really good at it. I think we can do it with respect to fire a little bit now, but on the water side, I'm not sure we really can. Cause I think that's what Jonathan was getting at is like, how do you actually compare, you know, what you think you would have if you did X versus if you didn't do it, if, you know, if this event happened or didn't happen. And I don't think on, on the scale of watersheds with water yet, we can do that. It'd be great if we could get there. I think if we're talking preservation for me, we need to think about preservation of landscape, preservation of function, not preservation as in don't touch, hands off, don't go. And I think that's part of what Hugh is saying that we've got to, there's got a, a lot of material needs to come off as we think of restoring or restoration of landscapes. That's where we need to be in thinking at that scale. And then I can talk about preservation. But if we talk about preservation as postage stamp areas or even larger, um, we know what's going to happen to them. Great. Britta, do you want to go? Go for it. Offense and defense, folks. That's all that's <laughs> that. Great. Let's let's do another question from Emily. Uh, we have um, a couple questions coming in about the role of small landowners and small private landowners. Britta started to touch on this. Um, but but William Johnson, you know, points out that in parts of Lassen County, for example, there's a lot of small private land holdings um, and, and is asking, how do we support support those folks? As part of as part of the, the recovery process. I'll jump in here to start. I see Jonathan, your mic is on too. Um, so remember in that uh, impact model, I referred to our place-based partners, right? So I mean, the, where we can really use the power of our resource conservation districts, our local fire safe councils, everyone has a role. And really that's just to get the outreach, to be able to 
make sure we can hear all the voices of those small lander, landowners. Um, you know, there's a lot of organizations that are that are doing that, whether it be American Forest Foundation or through the EQIP program at CAL FIRE. That said, you know, there's not enough. There's a huge opportunity to be able to do restoration on private landowner holdings and to be able to scale that up and have the conversation is it, it's, it's something we can do better at for sure. Um, I think that being able to package a lot of our resources uh, to, to be able to make it again easier, easier and faster for them um, is very important. So then we can go back to some of those uh, environmental compliance reforms as well as we were talking about earlier. We do a lot of prescribed fire on a bunch of different landscapes and um, out of my lab. And we do a lot of um, monitoring and um, I work with RCDs in different parts of the states. And, uh, and, you know, this is a slightly different subject, but it's a similar thing, right? We're actually getting the work done on private land is logistically simpler. Um, typically, doesn't mean it's logistically simpler for the landholder, but compared to what, you know, the steps that a federal or a state agency has to go through tends to be simpler. But uh, getting qualifications, getting the state to recognize the qualifications, getting them to allow you to actually do the work is another issue. And on top of that, the big issue is the micro size of a lot of these parcels. And man, I'm just, I'm not souring on prescribed fire right now. I wouldn't say that, but wow, it's really opening my eyes. The last few years of being really heavily engaged in just the whole monitoring side of it and trying to think about scaling this all up. Wow. I mean, when you think about how much work goes into in this state, just pulling off a 10 acre burn, it's astounding how many people and levels and permissions and trucks and engines. And oh, it's just, it's amazing. And, and it's, and there's a, there's a renaissance of people's of smallholder interest in sustainably managing their landscapes. I mean, John knows it better than any of us. I mean, it's just, Everyone wants to do it who owns a forest parcel anymore. They understand the threat they're under and a lot of them just want to do good. But wow, I mean, how do we stitch all these little piece, little parcels together? That's a really big question. And I, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, John's working right at that interface. I think we'll go to an, another question because I think we've got a lot. I'm getting beeped that there's a lot of good questions. So I want to I keep things moving. So Emily, can we go to another one, please? Sure, this is a question um, directed at, at Jonathan to start. As the convener of scale, which brings together community-based collaboratives doing much of the forest health work across the Sierra, can you share a few of their key findings and recommendations on how the state and feds can better support the collaboratives to help increase the pace and scale of forest health work? Um, for folks who don't know, SCALE is the Sierra California All Lands Enhancement Project. It, uh, convenes uh, quarterly, works with uh, a variety of collaboratives from across the state, um, as well as other groups that are convening collaboratives uh, like the California Landscape Stewardship Network. Um, yeah, we've actually just put out a paper that's based on some of the, the work of the collaboratives and the best thinking over the course of the last year. And essentially one of, one of the items has already been mentioned, this idea of uh, block grants Let's help folks not write a, a gazillion grants, but fund the collaboratives and the work that they need to do through block grants where they can again prioritize. A lot of the collaboratives have matured to the point that they can identify priorities. And then what do you do with those areas that don't have those mature collaboratives? How do you build capacity? And you had to work with NGOs and others because what we don't want to do is leave areas behind, leave communities and landscapes behind. So secondarily, what we're talking about doing is investing in capacity building for those areas. And there's a variety of ways to do that through organizational capacity building, uh, assisting some of the RCDs, and just a couple of other points that uh, were have been drawn out in the paper. We can put a link in for folks to take a look at it. We've already said it, it's invest in utilization infrastructure. We don't get that investment there. We're not going to uh, have any place to take a lot of the products that need to come out of the uh, forest and watersheds and also accelerate prescribed burning. So uh, then there's a sort of general state level kinds of things, better integration of state programs. That's no simple task, but it needs to be done. And uh, Assemblyman Wood mentioned it, in fact. Uh, and then some of the regulatory challenges that we have. And we're not talking about just simplistic streamlining to make things go faster, but there are ways that we can move faster with some of the obligations that come under NEPA, CEQA. Um, and so there's some capacity building there that's needed as well. And then lastly, 
uh, just supporting more adaptive management. And, and this can be as simple as when somebody has a project in a particular area, have a secondary or tertiary project, because what happens is when a project burns up, it's like the whole thing goes away in the year, two, three, four years that was spent on NEPA planning, doing all that other work. We need to be more mobile as opposed to that stop. We now need to spend two and a half years to reevaluate and do that. We need to think differently about how we do those projects. Those are just a few of the things. And uh, it's uh, there's a, a, a quick summary. I'll see if we can't get a link uh, for folks to take a look at that. All right, Emily, do we have another another question from the audience? Yeah, um, I think maybe this one would, would start with Christy. Um, how is meadow restoration applied at Sequoia National Park and has it proved an effective component into tr in trying to improve forest health? Um, and maybe Andrew could speak to that from the, the water perspective as well. Yeah, um, meadow restoration at Sequoia Kings has been going on um, for a long time, for a long time, starting in the uh, mid 1900s with um, the soil and moisture crews that actually went into the wilderness and put log check dams um, into meadows to try and stem erosion and restore um, water holding capacity. And, and that seems to be um, one of the main links for meadow, between meadows and forest health is that role that they're playing in water storage and snow accumulation and the slow release of that water. Um, we've done a lot of evaluation. A lot of those early projects, it turns out, didn't really work super great, um, which is not surprising, um, but there are new techniques to, to do that, to reverse erosion and get infill and reestablish um, the water holding capacity of both front country and wilderness meadows. And that continues to be one of our um, climate change um, adaptation and mitigation strategies. Yeah, maybe just to add to that a little bit, there has been quite a bit of, of meadow restoration work uh, in the Feather and State Water Project and, and DWR has been in, involved in a lot of it. Um, and I think from what, what I'm, what I, I'm no expert on it at all, but what I've learned a little bit is that um, most of them haven't been funded to do a lot of pre-project monitoring. So you don't have a lot of data about what the pre-project situation was, then you monitor a ton of things after the fact, but you really don't have a baseline from which to compare that to and say, hey, this is what we really achieved here. And so um, so that's you know one of the challenges I think that would be helpful in, in, in moving things forward, but you also don't wanna delay a project for two years while you monitor the baseline. So I, I don't know what the, uh, the, the resolution is there, um, but I think as, Jonathan alluded to, and I alluded to a little bit earlier, looking at other longer term data sets where you can grab that baseline condition a little bit uh, and tease out that relationship instead of um, necessarily responding to, you know, to waiting for monitoring. The other thing um, that I think we've seen a little bit of is, is where there has been restoration, that that has um, kept more moisture in the soil later into the season, and that has been a benefit for uh, slowing fires down and being a natural fire break. So even if it doesn't get you a huge water supply benefit, there may be, certainly there are ecological benefits, but there may be other benefits to, to slowing down and providing natural um, you know, breaks that, that achieve your, your goals as well. Yeah, I don't worry, don't, and don't forget the carbon benefits too. I don't think we've quantified those at all, but if you can keep peat systems wet, they're not gonna burn. And there's a lot more carbon generally in the soil than there is in the stuff growing on it. So it's something to think about. We don't have quantification of that yet really yet. Not anyway, not yet. yet. All right, we're gonna switch gears to one more, or one or two more questions. Um, Emily, what you got next? Yeah, we have a question coming in about the economics of the wood utilization campus um, that Jonathan was speaking out about. And then that may be tied to a, a separate question about um, the existence of long-term commitments for a steady wood supply for infrastructure and whether there are any emerging examples of that to, to take advantage of all the public investment we're seeing and leverage some private investment into the picture. 
I'll just say thank to thank you, Drew Crane and, and Nicolette for those uh, those queries. Um, the short answer to the economics of a wood utilization campus is they're difficult. Um, and typically to get launched, subsidy is is really critical because folks are not willing, generally not willing to invest because of a lack of confidence that material will continue to be forthcoming over the five and 10 and more years. So we see a lot of activities where folks can get money out after about six, seven, eight, nine years, the economics seem to play out there, but it's extraordinarily difficult without the long-term contracts uh, that Nick is asking about. And I think we're slowly making some progress and maybe that's gonna happen quicker uh, and sort of at a conservancy and Elliot, it, Elliot, you may want to respond to this one as well in terms of the, the, the challenges of doing that. But I'll say two more things about it. One, if what we can do is leverage some of the subsidy that I mentioned earlier, uh, along with long-term contracting, that's why this is a golden moment in terms of investing in utilization infrastructure. And this is infrastructure that can be around for the next 10, 20 years plus. Secondly, What's absolutely critical with contracting is that we need to be thinking in terms of 10 year contracting if we want to attract investment in facilities that need that investment to get built. And that's really difficult. And that's where things like Blue Forest Conservation, the work that the Conservancy is doing along with state and federal investment can make a difference in helping get these places launched and turning the economics around. Yeah, Jonathan, great, great answer. And I'll, I'll just weigh in that there are, you know, I think as, as Dirk Charlie said earlier, we got to stop talking about it and get out and, and work together on this. And I think that's, that's a key element. I, and I'm starting to see, we're starting to see a lot more action on the role that the state can play to help facilitate these investments in these wood campuses and, and new wood products facilities. You know, I touched on at the beginning of this talk work that we're involved in in Tuolumne County. We have $17 million to help stand up with flex, very flexible till terms for, for industry. Um, we see CAL FIRE coming online with their wood products and wood utilization grant program. We also have the Climate Catalyst Fund coming online in the, at, at the state, which is also looking at these uh, low cost, uh, flexible loan terms to, to, to new businesses. So I think we're going to need to you know, keep pushing those forward and see tell the success stories. But it can't be without some work on the supply side. So we have to take these opportunities we have in front of us to, to really move the needle to provide everything that these collab our collaboratives are working on to, sh to, to bundle that up to show that we have something good and that we're gonna be able to support these facilities in the long term. So we have to work on both sides, the financing side and that supply side. So I think there's some promising initiatives underway that we gotta keep working on. So I think we're running low on time. I wanted to just turn it to the panel if I have any last parting words you'd like to share with, the, with, with our audience and then I'll, I'll kick it back to Angie. I have, I have a quick parting thought that I think is hopeful, which is that, um, you know, we looked at all the wildfire acres increasing graph and what we're treating, which is increasing more slowly, but eventually those two lines are going to cross. And we're, I feel like we're actually in a pinch point of having to spend so much on suppression and wanting to scale up treatments and reforestation. Once the whole landscape's burned <laughs> under one form or another, um, then you have an opportunity to build a resilient landscape and not and spend less on suppression and do a lot more management of wildfire for ecological benefit. And CAL FIRE's plan and the Forest Service new um, plans reflect this as well. And that's where you're going to get your acres. That it's not, it can't be all drip torch boutique burning, and it can't be all um you know wood removal it's we're going to need it all and we're going to get a lot of acres out of beneficial managed wildfire once we've got our landscape figured out that's right yeah I, we in our in our uh, restoration framework that's one of the what i think one of the it's there's really not a whole ton of what i would call novelty in there you know it's classic for a synthetic document you're just trying to throw a bunch of good ideas into one place so people can access them quickly but I think one of the things that we tried to underline for people was that they shouldn't ignore those parts of wildfires in which the outcomes were actually beneficial. 
and and you know you know good because we tend to just walk away from those you can't do that because <laughs> landscapes are dynamic and and what christy was saying is is that's the same thing is that there also has to be focus there now mind you if you're if you're interested in avoided costs and you want to focus on the most important acres then you have to figure out another calculus for that because the most important acres are going to generally focused on you know fuel jackpots near strategic assets and resources and areas and things like that so there's a way to do that but that's what we're trying to uh, to incentivize uh, in in the in the national forest system and hopefully in other land, land managers and land owners is to understand that if the fire did great work and you're happy with the outcome, your work is never done. <laughs> you know, it's it provides you actually a nice opportunity to start to do some really light touch management on a, you know on a rotating schedule that will never end. It will never end for the rest of time, and you have to commit to it. But that's it's really important what Christy said. Ready? Go ahead. I see you. Ready? Yeah, I just add. I, I, thank you, Christy. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, you know. <laughs> In that vein, right now, you know, we've got our greenhouse gas reduction goals. We've got our 30 by 30 plan. We've got our, you know, 100 million acre strategy in the making. We've got our task force, which, you know, is, is in so many ways uh, being used as a planning arm, right? Like there's, there's a lot going on. We have right now the social and political will for $100 million. Let, like this moment it is now. Let's make sure. I mean, I, if I could just have like one call to action to anyone on the line today, it's like, how do how can you use your voice in the most meaningful way to make sure that that hundred million, if that doesn't come around again, that we've invested in the right places, right? So in the reforestation pipeline, in workforce and in infrastructure, so that we really can be doing what Hugh just said, right? Because this is never going to stop. We have to change the entire system and we've got that opportunity. So I did use your voice, use your voice. Thank you. You know, thanks for coming on, asking good questions and taking the time, but now let's actually have a snowball effect with that. So we've all got to be doing it. I'm going to jump in right there and say, Britta just did an amazing job of wrapping this for all of us. Um, deep, deep appreciation to our panelists. Really good conversation. Great questions from the audience. Thank you guys all so much for being here today and for being with us to talk about this really important conversation. So much of what, what I heard from you guys, right place, right time, right strategy, right scale, right partners, you know, right investment. I think that we're we're at a really good place to sort of do a deeper dive. And there's a lot of conversation about regional planning and meeting regions where they are, building on the work of existing collaboratives. So there's a lot of good momentum coming. Um, I want to reiterate that, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, but we need to have the cure there as well. So this was a really good, I think, deep dive starting point conversation on what that cure actually looks like for the long term and how it can benefit rural communities and the people who live and work in these landscapes that are burning. Um, so just thanks again to all of you. Thanks again to all of our participants. Before we sign off, I want to acknowledge and recognize SNC staff who did an amazing job of pulling this event together. Um, Brittany Kovich, our Policy and Outreach Division Chief, her team picks this event up every year, pull it together. Emily Blackmer in the background did a lot of the coordinating outreach to the people that you see in front of you. Elliot, awesome facilitator, good questions, great engagement from all of you. Um, all of our panelists who participated, um, Secretary Crowfoot and, and Regional Forester Everline, um, and Dirk Charlie, who kicked us off, I think, with a really important, um, the tribal perspective, which we can't lose as we move forward. So um, good food for thought. I hope that, um, you know, the participants enjoyed this eighth annual Watershed Improvement Program Summit. Um, we're pleased to bring you these deep dive conversations and we're just so happy to have all of you here and sharing your knowledge and your perspective um, from the work that you all do on a daily basis. So thanks to everyone um, until next year at the next summit, maybe. In any case, take care. You guys have a great day. Appreciate all of you. Bye-bye.